Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host for today, John DeLynn. It is September 4th, Labor Day 2023, and we are here in part two of an epic series on uh, the history of Mormon polygamy in, I don't know, four or five hours, something like that. We'll see. But we are so honored to have back in our studio again, the Lindsay Hansen Park of Year of Polygamy and Sunstone fame. Hey, Lindsay. Hello, polygamy. What fun. <laughs> yeah, it is fun. It's dark. Why do we laugh at dark things? That's a bad part of our business. We laugh at dark things. It's all the trauma. <laughs> it's a trauma response. I, I, I think we laugh because it's a way to heal. So I mm. actually don't apologize for that. Okay, but, neither. Uh, it is not a year of polygamy, just a few hours, everybody. So settle down. <laughs> it's not an eternity like some women. <laughs> RFM calls it, what does he call it? A decade of polygamy? Is that what he Something like that. I've heard it all. <laughs> it's all deserved. <laughs> anyway, we're excited to have Lindsay back and the Brian Buchanan of Benchmark Books. Hey, Brian. Hi, everybody. Good to be back. Thanks, to, thanks for coming. Well, if you... Uh, if you didn't catch part one of the series, pause this episode, go back to part one. We are covering, we, we lovingly called this episode, I think you called it, Lindsay, isn't one wife enough? I think I call, I, th I don't know. It's like um, the, what do we call it? What was the code name for this series? Like, what was Brian's title? What was it? All the polygamy history you didn't learn in seminary. There it is. All the polygamy history you didn't learn in LDS seminary. And last episode, we went from Joseph Smith and even his predecessors through the martyrdom um, in 1844 in Nauvoo. And uh, there are two major kind of periods to go. There's kind of Brigham Young, early Utah polygamy. And then I think we're going to be talking about um, FLDS and fundamentalist polygamy as a part three. We'll see whether we actually end up doing this in two parts or three. Um, but we're just going to see where we get. So Joseph Smith dies at the hands of a mob. Spoiler alert. Th this is why I know the Book of Mormon is true, because the pride cycle is real. We came in here last time and we're like, we're going to do the whole thing without <laughs> notes. And then at the very end, I didn't even stick the landing with the Mormon expositor. We're like, and Joseph Smith died, the end. <laughs> uh, we, I feel like we didn't cover so much, but I'm excited because today is my favorite time period in history, which is the Utah period, the frontier stuff, the cowboy stuff. Now, did you have disclaimers or anything you wanted to say about last episode or oh, corrections? I was, or? I was just kind of agonizing because we were talking a lot about, uh, you know, very sensitive things, sexual assault, rape, sex. Uh, and I, you know, I, we laugh at things, we make jokes and I made a joke about porn usage or amongst Mormon men or their, their search history and compared it to Joseph Smith. And I kind of agonized over that because... I, while it is true that Mormons are sex obsessed, I, I got to be careful that I'm not like sex shaming our community that has like so seeped in shame because we are a church that's so obsessed with with this topic. So I just wanted to like contextualize that and hope that I'm being sensitive when I'm talking about this. I want to allow for all experiences. There's so much pain around these issues. And so we do kind of make jokes about them sometimes because we interact with this stuff all the time and it's really, really dark and heavy. And so, yeah, I just want to make sure that I'm holding space for all different stuff. I do think that polygamy is about power, but I also want to recognize that like that doesn't dismiss the sexual part. And so I hope I didn't do that in the last episode. All right. Well, we're not going to ever make these, you know, make things perfect, but it, it's nice that we're trying. So that's good. I just, I think it's so hard. I mean, I remember blogging for feminist Mormon housewives and, you know, I've spoken out about the, the shame the church does, especially with the men on this issue. And I recognize it's such a wound for women too. I feel like it's such a, it, these topics are so hard for people because there's so much trauma and they reach people in different ways ways. And you don't have to be from a fundamentalist community. You can be from an LDS community and then the pain will hook you in different ways that you don't anticipate. So yeah, I just want to hold space for all of that mess while we're talking about this today, because we're going to be talking about some really dark stuff, uh, like really heavy stuff, not just, you know, sex or assault, but 
violence and murder and racism and all that kind of stuff. So uh, take care about who's within viewing or listening distance. Viewer discretion is advised. I would Listener say. Listener discretion? I would say so, yeah. They don't call it the Wild West for nothing. <laughs> okay. All right. I have a question. Uh, this isn't necessarily on your notes. Um, so Joseph had a small, a small circle of people in the know about polygamy, but I'm assuming there were a lot of top leaders that didn't know. And I don't even know if there's a way to sort of like take the first presidency, the apostles, the general authorities, and even get a sense for what percentage were knew and didn't. But as we talk about the succession crisis, I wonder if that plays in the kind of people who knew the principle and were in on the secret versus those who weren't. Is that an okay place to start? I think that's a great place to start. Do you want to, do you want to speak to that first? Sure. So at Joseph Smith's death, there are about 25 men and about a hundred women that are involved in polygamy. So it's, it's a small group, but it's a very powerful group. And so on the one hand, you have the Brigham Youngs, the Heber Kimballs, who are definitely in on it, who have married plural wives. But then you have guys like Sidney Rigdon, who are on the outs. And you have guys like he William He must Watt. have known about it because oh, Joseph he knew. had propositioned his wife. He knew. I mean, his and daughter. daughter. Right. Nancy, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. I would say at that point, there probably, there probably aren't any leaders that don't know. Okay. But there are definitely some who are not practicing. We're yeah, not guess, in that circle, really. I guess the Navajo Expositor removed all doubt. Definitely. Okay. Yep. Well, I mean, for the leadership, because we need to remember that there's still this huge amount of people that think that are believing the public denials. And that's going to play into the Utah period later on when you've got a lot of people who find out when the church is open about it. And they're like, wait a minute, what was that whole last decade of denial about? So it is the leaders, but What's interesting about the succession crisis, and Brian and I go into this uh, in quite detail on our Sense of Mormon History podcast, so you can listen to it, but uh, a lot of the, the break-off sects, like um, uh, the Strangites and the Cutlerites and all of these other folks have polygamy in their waters, too. So these guys aren't breaking over polygamy. Uh, they actually practice it and put their own spin on it, so... It's definitely something that you can't just attribute to Brigham Young. Yeah. Okay. And so, Brian, you were saying 25 men were in the know? Yeah, Did 25 you? men, about 100 women. 100 women. So, and that, that we know of. That we know of. Yeah. And that number will expand rapidly after Joseph Smith's death. Okay. Um, we go to, by the time they leave, it's in the hundreds okay. total. So it, 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 it bumps up very quickly. Okay. And that's an interesting point Lindsay mentioned is all of these groups that break off have to deal with it, whether that means doing it, whether that means denying it, they'll take different routes and it never ends well for those that do. String, it happens in his group and it's a, it's a very, that's part of what gets him killed. And then the Cutlerites will flatly deny that it ever happened in their group later on, even though it did on a very limited scale. So that's anyone that goes back to Joseph Smith era Mormonism has to deal with polygamy yeah. in one way or another. I, yeah. I would say that everyone who deals with Mormonism today still has to contend with polygamy because it seeps into the doctrine. Like I said, I think it's inherent in the endowment, in a lot of the temple oaths, in the covenants, in the language. Uh, it's all built to sort of satisfy these last few years in Nauvoo. And when you look at Mormon theology and development, that a lot of I would say Brighamite sects or, you know, like larger uh, LDS or Mormon movements have, they're taking doctrine that was, that originates in the Nauvoo period. So a lot of that has polygamy infused somewhere in it. And while we're talking about schisms, I guess Emma and Joseph Smith III and others end up creating what originally was known as the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I think we mentioned this last episode do we want to talk about how they dealt with polygamy? Yeah, we can talk about it a little bit. It's, so that actually doesn't happen until about the 1860s when Joseph Smith III is older. So for a while after the death of Joseph Smith, Emma really gets screwed over basically by Brigham Young and the other church authorities. And this becomes like a two-year battle after his death to you know, see who has charge of the land and different uh, members of the Smith family back Emma Smith. 
William Smith kind of changes teams a few times of who he's going to back. Um, That's Joseph's brother, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, no. The Smith siblings. Because yeah. again, like I said in the last episode, Mormonism was their enterprise. That's how they saw it. It wasn't just the Joseph Smith party. It was the Smith thing. And so th they just assumed that they would carry it on after his death. And of course, Brigham Young and others have different plans for that. So after it all shakes out and it doesn't shake in Emma's favor, you know, as far as the bulk, the majority of folks follow Brigham Young, he makes the, probably the most compelling argument, if you will. And so Emma disappears for a while. She goes away. She abandons Mormonism and just kind of escapes it. She gets remarried. Um, she doesn't really pick it back up until a few years later. But she always believed that her son, and, and there are some good cases that, that go all the way back to the Missouri period that state that her son was supposed to take over for Joseph Smith. So um, it, Missouri, am I right? Is that when the first- Liberty Jail. Liberty Jail, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, yeah, so it, their, their schism is interesting, but their, their whole doctrine becomes a reaction in a lot of ways to polygamy for a, a century. So- as the Brighamites, anyone who follows Brigham over, the Brighamites sort of develop a polygamous doctrine. They develop an anti-polygamous doctrine. And so they still have, you know, a doctrine and covenants that they build on. They still have all of these things, but it goes in a different direction. Uh, I would say more mainstream Christian than, you know, what Brigham Young does. And one of the interesting figures that's involved in that development is a man named William Marks. And our friend John Dinger is working on a book about him with Cheryl Bruno that will be fascinating because he's, during Nauvoo, a very important man, but then gets forgotten later on. And so he tells this, this slightly different narrative that towards the end of his life, Joseph Smith starts to argue that polygamy is wrong, and he's, he's repented of it, essentially. And that will come out several times. And... That's a problem because that's not Joseph Smith wasn't a polygamist. It was that he was, but then repented of it. And so that will become a narrative for a while until Joseph Smith III can finally squish that out and say, no, 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 my father was not a polygamist, period. I mean, it would make sense that it caused Joseph so much trouble that he would have towards the end said, uh, th this, I messed up, this got out of hand. Right. We have a few accounts, Mark's being probably the strongest one. Um, there are like third hand accounts that claim that Brigham Young had heard or that, you know, John Taylor had heard or whoever that Joseph Smith, you know, said at the very end, I've made a mistake. One account, and I forget who it was, basically has Joseph Smith saying, and I deserve to die for it. Mm -hmm. Right. Like this is my atonement and that's why I'm turning myself in. Uh, we mm. don't know because like a lot of Navajo polygamy, there's not a lot of extant sources, but Marx would go on to sort of perpetuate that narrative, which really becomes uh, a popular folk myth, I think, in the reorganization for a long time. Okay. All right. So where do we go in terms of uh, the succession crisis next? We get out of Navajo. That's what we do. <laughs> it's a, such a fascinating thing because... You have to think Joseph Smith could read the writing on the wall at least at some point beforehand, but yet he really doesn't develop a clear path forward. And during the 70s, Mike Quinn writes this fascinating article where he explores all of the options that were on the table. And he says there are eight possibilities throughout Joseph Smith's life that he put forward at one time or another. And obviously Brigham Young is one, Sidney Rigdon is one, uh, David Whitmer, Oliver Cowdery, one of the Smith brothers. Um, there's all these different things that are possibilities, but they were never really fleshed out. Even the Brigham Young one isn't. And that's something that most modern LDS Mormons don't realize, is that is not something that was as, as cut and dried and logical as it will later be portrayed. And I yeah. think that's important because it wasn't that Joseph Smith died and then Brigham step, steps up and he's the new guy. No, there's actually a two-year period where nobody knows what's going on. Brigham Young and, and, and a lot of men who hear news of Joseph Smith's murder in Carthage start making plans right away of what they're going to do. In Brigham Young's case, I'm being very reductive here, but he basically says, listen, Sidney Rigdon's a nice guy. He helped Joseph for a long time, but he's a little bonkers now with the head, the head stuff, and he doesn't know the drill. 
we do as a body, as the quorum of the 12, we have the keys within us, all of us together. So we're going to, no one can replace Joseph. That was the, the, the brilliance of his, of his like pitch to everybody was no one can replace them and we're not going to try but between us, between all of us guys, maybe we'll make up enough to be like Joseph Smith. And that made sense to a lot of people. They're like, okay, you know, the power is with the 12. They can, they can bring us to Zion or whatever. And, and at this point, they're going to go to war. You know, Nauvoo might be going to war with the outsiders. So what, what's, why, is, why is that? Because Thomas Ford, we had talked about this before. So we have the Nauvoo Expositor which brings, you know, the Mormons destroy a printing press, which leads to the death of Joseph Smith, basically. The death doesn't stop the hatred against the Mormons. It helps, I, in a sense, like everyone's like, oh, no, what do we do? But Thomas Ford basically tells the Mormons, listen, you still have to leave. You know, we're not going to exterminate you. We're not going to do what Missouri did. But you got to get out of here because I can't stave off this justice for because because there's a lot of problems still going on. Um there was a lot of counterfeiting that Mormons were doing at the time. There were um, issues of property and land deeds and the, and the Nauvoo militia and the charter and all of this stuff uh, was happening. And so the Mormons were still in trouble and there wasn't a good, um, they weren't going to stop basically. And Mormons, some Mormons wanted revenge for Joseph Smith's death. So it was this idea of like, what are the Mormons going to do now? Are they going to escalate? So, Thomas Ford basically negotiates and says, please leave. And so the Mormons are like, we're going to leave. Um, they think that they have more time than they do, but they don't. And they, uh, so the first company with Brigham Young and several other leaders get out and start to head west. They have no idea where they're going. It's not like they're like, and we're going to Utah. No idea where they're going. They just knew that they had to get out as soon as they could. And that happens in waves. Um, we really call it like the three acts. There's three acts. The first act is, um, you know, Brigham Young's group going sort of the camp of Israel is what they call it. They, they start off as far as the Missouri River. And then the last group are the really poor and disabled and elderly folks or the orphans. They're like stuck there and they get caught in what's called the Battle of Nauvoo. Basically, they, they, um, it's an actual battle. There's a cannon brought in that they're firing, you know, apostates or sorry, Gentiles who have now taken over and taken the land from the Mormons are firing cannons at the people. Uh, they, the Mormons that are there do this dance, this cursed ritual dance in the temple where they basically curse the temple and anyone in it. And then they leave writing on the temple, basically saying, come after us, bro. That's like the message. And they're the last and they end up at the tail end. And it's chaos. Winter quarters is chaos because they weren't prepared they didn't have enough time. They don't know where they're going. And so what they end up doing, Brigham Young makes a deal with the government um, to illegally encroach on Omaha land. Omaha, uh, there was a bunch of tribes living there. Andrew Jackson had negotiated this treaty that said, OK, if we get rid of all the indigenous folks as far as America goes right now, we'll leave you alone. We promise. As this side of the Missouri, you guys are safe. We will leave you alone. We won't encroach on your land. The Mormons go and encroach on the land and illegally. And Brigham negotiates um, a little deal. He says, how about government? If you let us stay here illegally, we will send you some men for the Mormon battalion. And of course, you know, the o Omaha don't really have a say in this. In fact, Indian agents and the tribes that are there, uh, the Potawatomi, am I saying there? I always say it wrong. Potawatomi. Potawa Potawatomi. The Potawatomi, um, they complain about Mormon encroachment. They're eating their cattle. Uh, they're Sorry, they're eating their grass. Um, they're killing off all the resources. And they're breaking all of these treaties, but Brigham was really smart in negotiating with the government. So he has that encampment, and then there are a few behind him um, that start in major areas are Garden Grove. That's where the poor people were living. Mount Pisgah, and then um, the place that we know as Winter Quarters, which is—do you want to talk about that? So that was the— 
the headquarters at the time. So you have all these these different little way stations that some people would stay there for longer and get things ready for people coming, but then others were just sort of progressively moving their way until they realized it's not going to happen yet. So we better we better hole up here, and that becomes an interesting place because they had been more or less moving, but now it's sort of a, a settlement, and so that's where polygamy starts to happen again, and. There's this very interesting statement from Lorenzo Snorri says, we now felt more free to do these things, but they're still not doing a lot of marriages yet, and it's ugly. And we have one of the stories that we talked about on the History Podcast was Patty um, uh, Sessions, whose first wife marries more or less without her knowledge. And Patty has a very busy life. She's already trying to run her household, but then she's also a midwife and constantly being called out on cases. So uh, this new wife comes into the family, seems to be not really willing to pull her share. And so there's tension there. And her diary is so fascinating because she'll talk about David went and slept with her last night and I'm just miserable. And so we get these pictures of how these relationships actually worked in winter quarters in a time where they are very poor and there's a lot of disease, there's a lot of scurvy going around, and then you add the tension of these relationships that they don't really know how to make work. Are they intense? Mostly intense, lots of mud, uh, not not very fun at all. And it's, it's getting cold, right? It's very cold, and there are stories of these women will go visit each other. There were the Partridge sisters, one... Uh, that had to marry Brigham Young, and her sister comes to see how she's doing, and she says, there's just mud everywhere. And there's this this fascinating account, or this, this hilarious account where she says, we're all in the tent, and I think the only reason that we didn't freeze is the frost didn't have anywhere to get in because the tent was so full of people. So hmm. not a very fun period of time. There are a lot of reasons why winter quarters mostly gets ignored in Mormon history, and that's one of it, is it's just very bleak. <laughs> It's not a fun time. And it's confusing. At one point, there are like 60, um, you know, encampments all strung along across the Missouri. And the Grand Encampment is Brigham's uh, Vanguard Company, I guess. It's the first one that goes out. And then you got to picture it as like, you know, just this crowd of people. They don't want to be in Nauvoo. Being in Nauvoo is dangerous. People that were staying back in Nauvoo were getting beaten up on the streets, like, like you know, People were hearing about the Mormonites and how terrible they were. And you could go. It was a free-for-all. You could go get a shovel and beat an elderly Mormon guy. And that stuff was happening. People didn't want to be there. But Brigham had no idea where they were going. They didn't even know if they could stay there. So he's there first. All these people get crowded in. Brigham gets really pissed at everybody. He was like, everybody stop and slow down. But if you're the guy at the tail end, you don't want to be there. And so they're frustrated. And so they kind of come out in a hurry. They're not well prepared. And you really start to see the economic divide. Now, for Brigham Young um, being, uh, he's really hard for me. I struggle with him. I will say at this point, he is living pretty rough like the rest of them. They're living in tents. Eventually in, in Nebraska, they build you know, little lot, they give lots to people and they build some cabins and it's pretty rudimentary, but it's more like a village. They're farming on land that doesn't belong to them, but they are, uh, you know, trying to set up a little city to, to make way stations. Garden Grove is the interesting place because in the Grand Encampment, you have this formal establishment of polygamy. You've got Eliza Snow and there are stories of like, they actually have cabins, some of them, and they'll spend their nights singing and making, you know, poetry together and doing art and having these things. The further you get away from the Grand Encampment and you have these poor people, the rougher it gets. And this is where we discovered this story of uh, one of Bill Hickman. He, Bill Hickman would be a henchman for Brigham Young in the Utah period. He uh, convinces one of his plural wives to run a body house out of her wagon box, basically. Like she's running a prostitution two other Mormon customers in Garden Grove. And so it's interesting when we think of like these pure Mormon pioneers, Garden Grove with a whole branch gets cut off because they're stealing from each other. Uh, they're selling sex to survive. They are, there's a lot of fights and abuse, but they're poor. They don't have resources and they had to get out at the last minute. And so it's, it's a really tough spot. So 
this is kind of all the stuff that's happening in winter quarters. It's more wild than people think. It, for those who follow your podcast, this goes without saying, but what happened to Joseph's 30 to 40 wives, right? Plural wives. I mean, I guess a lot of them, many of them were already married to men, but I'm just, do you guys want to just let our never Mormon listeners and viewers know what happened to them? Yeah. So after his death, that was, uh, there was the question of what to do with a lot of Joseph Smith's stuff, including his wives. And I hate to be so, you know, mm -hmm. coarse about it, but that's what it was. And so several men step up to say, you know, they can be sealed to me. And Brigham Young is one of them, Heber Kimball and uh, Amasa. It's another... How do you say it? Uh, the descendants usually go for Amos or Amos. I, I can't say words right at all. Um, so those three are basically the three that say, we'll, we'll be the guys. You can be sealed to us. Most people choose Brigham or Heber. I think one chooses Amasa. Is that right? Uh, one of the Partridge sisters, um, Eliza, marries him. Yeah. And the, the ones that rolled the dice on Heber would live to regret that. But Brigham, basically, they all marry his apostles. They get sealed for time only as plural wives, which means they're under their charge. Uh, Brigham Young has children with a few of them. Uh, Eliza R. Snow is one that he inherited. They, they never have children. Um, Heber... I don't know. We'll talk about Heber. Being married to Heber is a rough gig. Mm. The polyandrous ones were very interesting because uh, there is there are a couple ways that relationships go. There's one, Patty Sessions, for one, stays with her husband and solely, doesn't marry anyone else. And but then others like. But then he, mar but her husband takes on. Then he marries wives. other women. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's and ugly. She hates it. She's not a fan. Um, but then, for example, you have someone like Zion Huntington. Who is who is still nominally married to her first legal husband, but then marries Brigham Young, and is sealed to Joseph Smith by proxy, and and it's pretty clear that her first husband is getting pushed out of the way. He goes on a, a mission to the east, comes back. He's with W. W. Phelps, and unauthorized polygamy happens on the trip back. That's ugly, and then he gets back to town to realize, ah, my wife is now completely with Brigham Young. Hmm. So the, those polyandrous ones are rough. Hmm. And we didn't even talk about this in the last episode, but the women that were involved in polygamy, the secret polygamy, were really heavily involved in the women's organizations, including the Relief Society. And it takes a break during this time because, first of all, it's hard to organize. Second of all, Emma was in charge and Brigham has a conflict with Emma. And so the women are meeting in sort of like these informal gatherings and tents and things like that. But it would be the women who are the plural wives mostly. And they're still trying to care for the poor and the needy. But it's really hard because they don't have a lot of resources themselves. You talked about authorization. By the end, was Joseph the one that was always saying who got to marry who? Was that did that get pretty solidified? Pretty much, yeah. That that authority doesn't get very far away from him during his life, and even during the the rest of Nauvoo, it's pretty close to Brigham Young. He's he's got a tight grasp on it. It's only once they move out of Nauvoo that it starts to get messy because the people are spread out, and that that tends to spread the authority out, even if Brigham doesn't want it to. And so the the Henry Jacobs case, who's married to Zion Huntington, is fascinating because they're coming back and they just feel like they can perform marriages. And W.W. W. Phelps does that and gets himself yelled at and excommunicated. And so as they, they start to move west for a time, that authority branches out. And Brigham is not happy about that. And that's a, a long, ongoing process to gather that authority back in and get it under his control. So what does Brigham, you know, how does Brigham want polygamy authorization to happen? He doesn't know yet. And the, you can see this in the case of a, of a guy named James Emmett. So there are two guys that are in leadership and they're in the Council 50. George Miller is a bishop. Uh, James Emma is a leader. Was he an apostle? What was his role? He was just Council 50. Mm -hmm. So these are two guys. James Emma is like a really hardened frontiersman and he had really good connections with the indigenous people. So he was a, he was an asset to the, to the 12. Um, George Miller has his own like messy foray with polygamy. James Emmett, before they even, before the Mormons leave Nauvoo, decides to take an uh, like an advance party of a hundred people out to find a spot to, to camp. And he basically turns it into a frontier sex cult. He starts 
uh, ordering everyone to give their wives to him. He's going to be in charge of all of them. He makes them give all of their property to him. A bunch of women escape back to Nauvoo barefoot, and they're mostly elderly women saying, this guy's gone off the rails. Brigham Young has a choice here. What do I do? He does nothing. He convinces James Emmett to get out. And they're in the the wilderness for like six months or something. They're like out there for a while having this crazy polygamy sex cult. And they come back. Brigham Young forgives them. He's like, don't do that again. James Emmett, George Miller go off to the Ponca settlement. They do it again. And of course, Brigham Young doesn't do anything. Eventually he gets cut off from the church. But you can see that Brigham is not confident in his power right now. He has to keep people together and he has to convince them that he's still the guy because at this point it's still kind of messy and you have options. George Miller leaves. You can follow George Miller. You can follow Lyman White to Texas and some people do. And so Brigham Young is trying to be very careful and not make too many enemies at this time. But eventually he wants to be the guy making the decisions. And I only ask that because... That was one of the things that just seemed so wrong about Warren Jeffs is that he was just assigning women as sort of his power, his favorites, his power structure, his nepotism, his cronyism. Does that make sense? Brigham Young will definitely get there, uh, especially during the Mormon Reformation. But it's in the 1850s that you have Brigham Young officially uh, uh, like voted in as a prophet, seer and revelator, but not at first. He... He wasn't at first. In fact, people still in his own leadership thought that they could challenge him. They didn't think that he knew all the things. And we actually argue in our podcast, and I think this is true, that Brigham Young, the reason, the route he takes to Utah and the reason why he settles in Utah is to show people, trust me, I'm the guy. Because we talked about the Boston, Massachusetts breakoff group earlier, the the Smash Brothers, we call them. It's William Smith. you know, Joseph Smith's unruly brother and Sam Brannon and a few others. Sam Brannon was a man that was respected, had a lot of power, very charismatic. He goes ahead of winter quarters to California. He beats the Mormons in Utah by two months in California. Um, on behest of Brigham Young, they, they travel by boat. He takes 100 Mormons out there, and he is trying to get the Mormons to come to California. And he eventually has a conflict with Brigham. But at this point, Sam Brannon thinks that he's acting with the power of the 12. He doesn't think that Brigham Young is this power hungry guy. He'll find out pretty soon that he's wrong. But it, like I said, I guess I just bring that up to say it's a messy time. So Brigham Young isn't messing with the authority too much. He is allowing ceilings a little bit. But again, they've got bigger fish to fry as far as like, you know, who is going to eat what and who's going to live where. Okay. Now, Lindsay, you mentioned counter, you mentioned counterfeiting at one point. It, Brian, is there anything else you want to mention about counterfeiting in winter quarters? Yeah. And, and this is the shadow that follows them from Nauvoo. And this is some really interesting research that our friend Marianne Clements has been putting together that the traditional narrative is that Mormons end up leaving Nauvoo early because these counterfeiting indictments come down against Brigham Young and some of the other leaders, she's arguing that it's it's actually very different. What happens is you have these organized counterfeiting rings that are operating in Nauvoo, maybe with some knowledge by church leaders. It's very it's not quite clear on that. What happens is one of uh, these the guys, bogus Brigham thing. Brigham Young knew. Well, that that's they have a guy. Brigham Young is, uh, there's a warrant out for his arrest, and they have a guy dress as Brigham Young in the temple, in the Nauvoo temple, and pretend to be Brigham Young and get arrested. And they, like, all laughed about it forever. So Hmm. the leaders knew about it. Well, the question is, how much were they involved with it, though? Sure. So what she's arguing is that what happens is one of the guys that's involved in these counterfeiting rings starts ratting out the other guys. And the other guys use these indictments as a way to punish this guy. And the, the move up of the exodus is just simply fallout because of that. And so she's, she's arguing that that traditional narrative of how counterfeiting plays into the end of Nauvoo is actually probably a little different than that. So what happens is that never really gets resolved. And so that follows them through to winter quarters. And the Garden Grove settlement that we mentioned, they have a couple bogus presses that are buried there. And so there's a lot of shadiness that's going on that because it's never brought out into the open and dealt with in a, in a, a solid resolution, it just keeps happening. You're reminding me of an episode I did with Kathleen Melanakis, who talked about early Mormon counterfeiting kind of before Joseph Smith and maybe during. So that, you know, if people want to check that out, 
those allegations or practices actually go start appearing early in the Smith family with Joseph's what parents and grandparents? Is that right? Yeah, there are. It's hard because she's on the one hand sort of the trailblazer there. She's the first one that's really writing about it. There's a lot of work to do. There's some more work to do. There are there are some issues with some of her research, but she's you know anytime you're the first one to write about it. That's the hardest because you don't have anything to rely on, really. Brian's such a kind guy, isn't he? Yes. <laughs> Marianne, I, and he's a smart guy. We were a little too. I was a little too hard on her when we talked about this, and Marianne pushed back and says, "No, no, 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 no. Be nicer to her." So, <laughs> okay, I, I tried to listen. All we right. we each have our favorites with historians that we that we really trust, and sometimes we disagree on 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 folks. But yeah, I would say Marianne Clements, who's writing on this. Really good stuff. Thumbs up. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anything else we want to say about winter quarters? Uh, I guess there's secret polygamy and women who go rogue. Did we cover those? Oh, yeah. So that's something that we found in the research. I was doing uh, an episode on the women of the Mormon battalion, the women who were sort of left behind. And I found this curious entry. And so this is my challenge. This is what I was going to tell Julia. Like, Julia, if you're looking for something to write on or publish on, we need someone to look into this. Found an account of nine women who, when their husbands leave for the battalion, you know, these are nine women that are staying back, like many women in the battalion uh, that had to stay back. And they pretty soon learn about the secret polygamy and they are not having it. And they're like, the, the church is going in the wrong, wrong direction. We don't like this. But now we're stuck out here. What do we do? We can't go back. We don't have enough supplies to go back. So we're going to go forward. They organize uh, a little wagon company with their se- one of the 17-year-old sons of one of the women leads them. He becomes their trail guide. And they follow, um, is it the Missouri River or the Mississippi? I think the M- Missouri River, uh, like as far as they can to a place that they settle called Plum Creek. And they... They leave the church because of polygamy and they live on their own for two years. Their husbands are gone. There's no mail going back and forth this time. So their husbands don't even know that they're gone. And they get back finally from the battalion and realize that their wives aren't there waiting for them. And they eventually find them and they all leave the church together and settle on this little encampment. But I just think it's really cool. We'd never hear about the people that said no to it. And they, here are these nine women to be nine women on the frontier with all your kids and to settle out on this, in this wilderness, which is, you know, um, Indian country. It's dangerous. It, the place that they, that they settle has a lot of warring, um, between the Sioux and other, other tribes. And so it's a dangerous place to, to be. And they, they survive. Mm. I think it's kind of cool. Fun. So we need more about that. Okay. Someone, someone researched that. Okay. Um, okay. And just overall, polygamy is still, it's not broadly known amongst the membership, just amongst the elite, even in winter quarters. Is that right? The secret is definitely getting out, but the, the amount of marriages that are actually happening are not a lot. For a lot of things, Brigham Young is is trying to put the brakes on until they can get somewhere permanent. And that applies to a lot of things. There's not a lot, you know, while... Nauvoo, they had really ramped up temple ordinances, for example. In winter quarters, that's that pretty much grinds to a halt. So it's a lot of things are put on pause until they get somewhere, their permanent settlement, wherever that might be. Yeah. I just have to say, I'm, I mentioned this last episode, I'm reading Barbara Jones-Brown and Rick Turley's book, second book, well, on, on Mountain Meadows Massacre. And I, I'm seeing just how um, just crazy Brigham Young is acting, you know, once, you know, during the time of the Mountain Meadows Massacre, clearly this Nauvoo and Winter's Quarter's trauma has to be informing Brigham Young's later crazy behavior before and after and during the Mountain Meadows Massacre, right? Oh, yeah. I think he's insecure in his power and following Joseph is a tough act because they were very different people. And you know, just in the case of Martha Brotherton, that's a great example that we talked about last time. I love that he was denied so hardcore and like publicly humiliated. But what we don't realize is with another one of his plural wives, uh, Augusta Adams Cobb, am I getting the right one with the trial in Massachusetts? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he has this very um, embarrassing, uh, it's it's an adultery scandal because, you know, people aren't recognizing polygamy at the time. This is pre- um, 
winter quarters. And so he has to go and have his name dragged in the Massachusetts press, which mattered to him because that's, you know, his home turf. And he's painted as this terrible person. And um, a lot of people, uh, including Connell O'Donovan, who I think is a great researcher, believes that that Brigham Young's racism and his ideas on miscegenation come from this humiliation, because here you've got William Smith or Joseph T. Ball, who might be, you know, um, a black man in Boston collecting wives and Brigham can't get anyone to marry him. And yet, if he does, he's embarrassed and humiliated. So you see... In all Mormon doctrine, really, Mormon theology is developed, I hate to say this, I'm sorry to the faithful, but it's out of the insecurities of the men in charge. That's what it is. It's a response to that. And Brigham Young is such a great case for that. And especially in winter quarters, he's really insecure about his power. And you see that in the decisions he's making. A couple of thoughts on that line. One of the things that he has to deal with is the fact, and part of the reason that he doesn't act more strongly with some of these guys is they do have commissions that go back to Joseph Smith. James Emmett, Lyman White, a lot of these guys were commissioned by Joseph Smith to do certain things. And so Brigham, on the one hand, loves Joseph Smith and wants to uphold his legacy as much as anyone else, but you can see sometimes he gets pushed a little too much and he has to say, now hold on, I'm my own guy. And that's a theme that we'll see happen throughout the history of polygamy is what happens after a change of leadership. What happens when the previous guy authorized something or winked at something or they think he winked at something, but now the new guy's here? How does he deal with those previous commissions? That's a very important part of this history that gets overlooked. And that's part of Brigham Young's challenge. What to do with these Joseph Smith era commissions to do certain things. Hmm. That all sounds really... Um, important. And I just also want to note just kind of the obvious that they got ran out of Nauvoo, I guess ran out of Kirtland, ran out of Nauvoo. Now they got run out of, Na sorry, Kirtland, Missouri, and then Nauvoo. He's like in charge of all these people. They're pretty much refugees, like living in tents on the frontier. He's got to feel so much pressure and so much anger for the way the government has handled it, allowed this to happen, he, he, he must leave, arrive at winter quarters and arrive in Utah, very bitter and very angry about the, the government's treatment and about how the Mormon people were treated. That's probably pretty obvious, but I mean, at this point and, and throughout all of Nauvoo, they're sending, they're sending emissaries to, uh, Washington. And, and one of the, one of these guys that he he sends several men on a mission to Washington, DC, and they make friends with a guy named Thomas Kane. Thomas Kane is a non-Mormon who becomes an ally for Mormons up into the massacre period. Um, who he's really one of the few people who is sympathetic to the Mormon plight. In fact, if you read his, his book, uh, among the Mormons, is that what the it? Mormons, the Mormons, he gives the most sympathetic, heart wrenching uh, view of Nauvoo as it's being abandoned. And he was able to like, cause I get cynical cause these are my ancestors. And I'm like, you guys read the room. You're just making all the choices. Like, the, of course people are responding this way. You're, you're taking up all the power. You're being dishonest. You're doing all these things. Thomas Kane makes me go, Oh, these poor, like it's, it's the leaders making the poor choices. It's, all of the rest of the people that are paying the price for it. And Thomas Kane really gives you a sympathetic, if you want a sympathetic look at Mormons and Navos are leaving, read his, his accounts. All the skills of John C. Bennett, none of the messiness. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No tomatoes either, though, unfortunately. No there tomatoes. are downsides. He was, he was tiny, though, like John He was Bennett, a little guy. Little guy. Well, he, he, appears, Tom, he appears Thomas in Kane. Brown and Turley's book quite a bit. Oh, so yes. It's been fun. He was it. very, very helpful to them yeah. at many points along yeah. the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why we, I mean, we named a county after him. Kane Winter county. Quarters is Canesville for yeah. a while. So, yeah. yeah, they were very fond of him and rightly so. Yeah. Okay. All right. So are we leaving Winter Qu Winter's Quarters? Finally. Winter quarters? Yeah. Finally. Okay. So they were there how long? Well, so depends they, on who you are. <laughs> that's right. It depends on who you are and where you go. The Vanguard finally leaves um, at the, the end of 1846 into 1847. And it, they have a few false starts, but basically it, it plays into the battalion. The battalion is sent forward. So they actually, Mormon men in the battalion, the 500 men that are sort of 
the payment for rent on this land, uh, make it to California first, and then they, they come back. And of course, that's a really interesting story too. And we have to look at the Mormon migration as it becomes its own economy. Uh, as Mormons go, they're unique in the sense that they sort of take advantage of this opportunity. They set up outposts and way stations because up until this point, it really is unexplored land. There are uh, Spanish missions that exist from the, you know, Spanish invas invasion that's been happening for centuries in the Americas, but there's really very few things. There's Fort Bridger that's way out there uh, that's owned by fur trappers and explorers, but we don't really have any government outposts. So the Mormons are going at the same time the government is starting to realize, hey, California might be something. Right now it's Mexico. Um, and as soon as the Mormons get there, the Mormons settle in Utah and it's Mexico when they get there. It doesn't stay Mexico for very long. It's about a year uh, that the Mormons are in Mexico and then it, you know, becomes uh, purchased off of slave money um, by the United States from Mexico. And then it becomes, then we get into the territorial struggle. But when the Mormons are going across, Brigham has no idea where he's going and he doesn't know for a long time. And there's a lot of disagreement within his own church. That's why George Miller and James Emmett start to disagree. They're like, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Sam Brannon, of course, thinks California is a place. I really agree. I wish we would have settled in the Yerba Buena in San Diego. <laughs> It'd be warmer. <laughs> um, but Brigham Young, you know, finally makes it. The Vanguard's very interesting. A lot of interesting things happen, you know. Um, and then they get to Utah, and the famous this is the right place happens. Um, Brigham is sick. He uh, The first year in Utah is really, really rough. Um they go about setting up farms for the next wave of people right away. So that was their, the first year is really set up to do that. But after that, the Mormons start thinking about power. How are we going to live here? How are we going to uh, maintain this land uh, that we have now, you know, displaced all these Utes from? And how are we going to maintain that power? And so that's where we get into the Utah period. So were you like living in the Salt Lake, what is now Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County, were they living in this valley? So when Mormons get to the area, there are several tribes. So they had actually met Jim Bridger. Jim Bridger is not a friend to Mormons. At first, he's very polite, but pretty soon the Mormons will turn on him. But Jim Bridger says, hey, I think you shouldn't go in the Salt Lake Valley. Uh, there's too many Utes there. If you go a little further south by Utah Lake, there's water. There, you know, the Utes are friendlier there. there. You know, he gives him some good advice that Brigham Young doesn't follow at first. So up in the north part of where the Mormons settle, you've got Shoshone, and then you've got the Utes in the main valley of Utah, Salt Lake Valley, um, and you've got different uh, bands of Utes, like like. Um, there are different names, the Paiutes, the pa Pavans, the Paiutes. Uh, Timpanogos, we originally thought were Utes, but we think are Shoshone. Um, there's some debate of who they belong to. And then you've got the Goshutes and the Navajo and the Arapaho up by um, Wyoming. So there are these different tribes. There are all kind of intermarried or interrelated. A lot of them speak Numic religion or language. And so the Mormons get there and they contend with the Utes first and foremost, some of the big Ute um, chiefs like Wakara. So Wakara is one of the, the first chiefs that the Mormons start to negotiate with early on. Okay. All right. And polygamy factors into that as well. Hmm. So um, you mentioned Orson Pratt. And uh, the seer going public. Okay, so in 1850, the Mormons uh, petitioned to have Utah, the state of Deseret, sorry, the area become a territory, and they proposed Deseret, which is huge. It's like, how would you explain it? Oregon, Nevada. So you get you get basically all of Nevada, parts of California, parts of Idaho, parts of Colorado. Yeah, it's this massive. Brigham Young has has a grand vision of what's going to happen because basically what it is, it's from where they settle, it's this whole network to the sea, and they want they want to control that whole that whole way there. Oops, and so they want they want to make sure they've got a, a handle on all of that. And the government's like, that's nice, 
maybe not quite that much. And so when the territory is finally organized, it gets chopped down considerably and then gets whittled down more over the years. So 1850, they petitioned for this. And, and earlier, when Sam Brandon goes to California, he's there at Sutter's Fort when they discover gold, not long after the Mormons arrive in Utah. So the gold rush begins, which means the Mormons are in the middle of the United States now. They're the way station to this gold rush. And a lot of traffic are going to come in, a lot of people, a lot of money, a lot of power for the Mormons. So they petition for this territory. The government says too big. They cut it down. Brigham Young is made um, territorial governor, which is a term of four years, which he makes almost two terms. <laughs> He's kicked out in 1857. But his first term, he gets, you know, a little full of himself. He puts his own guys in the territorial legislature. And they, in 1852, they decide in a, a civic meeting that they're going to go public with polygamy. And this is where Orson Pratt comes in. Orson Pratt, uh, the great publisher, the great scientist of Mormonism, publishes a pamphlet called The Seer. They get really excited and they announce it to the world. Yes, we are polygamous and you can too. It's a great doctrine. It's the right doctrine. And this is where you get all those terrible quotes from Heber and Brigham about, you know, monogamy being a sin and a curse. And, and you know, monogamous babies are uglier than polygamous babies. And ancient Rome fell because they were monogamous and all of these crazy quotes. And Orson Pratt goes to Washington, D.C. to share the good news. And it doesn't go so well for the Mormons. Mm. And this is just probably the first major time where Mormon leaders in Salt Lake refuse to read the room. They've got John Bernheisel back in, in Washington as the delegate to Congress, and he is, on the one hand, a much more cultured man than Brigham, Heber, a lot of these guys. He's much better educated, but he's also very pragmatic, and he knows that if Mormons want statehood, if Mormons want anything done, they've got to be more strategic about it. Step number one there is shut up about polygamy. And this is one of my favorite moments of this. He writes back to Salt Lake and says, guys, you're trying to petition for this. Can you shut up about polygamy for just a little while? And there is a register of letters received, and there's a check mark by it. And it's eight days later that Orson Pratt stands up in, in August 1852 and announces polygamy to the world. Hmm. While John Bernheisel is going balder back in Washington, D.C., <laughs> pulling his hair out. Really quickly, one of the really disturbing things I remember reading is how the missionaries, Mormon missionaries, were sent to Europe or England, and I guess people are asking questions, and so they're... You, do you guys want to tell that story? You're both naughty. I'll yeah, just no, I was just going to bring this up. That's why I'm okay. naughty. Uh, because is, that, are you, is the story about to tell before? No, it's this It's okay. this time period. So be okay. before, so Mormons are going to England really early in church history. Uh, Mormon church leaders, apostles have all been to England on a mission and they're having great success and we're having huge waves of, of European uh, immigrants, mostly English immigrants at this point that are coming over. They're really excited. There had been rumors of polygamy, but you know, they were denying them when this 1852 thing comes out and it gets published and it's undeniable. You have missionary work gets cut in half. You have a bunch of people who have suffered and been persecuted in England go, wait a minute, what? This whole thing that you've said isn't true is true, and you have a lot of people that leave the church, but you have a lot of people who are stuck now, who are either on their way over or start to be on their way over. The, the church institutes pretty early on the PEF, the uh, Perpetual Immigration Fund, which basically says, we'll pay your way over, but then you're indebt indebted to us. So a lot of people are on that plan, and they're stuck, and it's a really tragic moment where you have women in England, uh, whole congregations crying, wait, polygamy is true? What? This is real? And th there was a sense of betrayal. And so a lot of people leave. And polygamy, turns out, is not a good missionary tool. <laughs> and it really kills missionary work. And you don't see missionary work turn around until the third manifesto, basically, second and third manifesto, when the church finally, the, the LDS church finally kicks it to the curb that missionary work ramps up again because people are not converting in spite of Heber Kimball's great literature that it's such a great thing for the human race. <laughs> so who who were the 
Who are the missionaries that were practicing polygamy, but telling people back in England that there was no polygamy? Carly Pratt. <laughs> Taylor is the, the the very interesting one because John Taylor the third. Heber prophet Kimball. Of the they, I mean, like most of them went to Brigham went to a mission. I don't know if he was polygamous at the time because this is 1830. Not until he comes back. Yeah. Yeah. But John Taylor will in print. And there's a debate um, while he's in France, and he's debating. The, the tenets of Mormonism, he will say in print flatly, we do not practice polygamy. He had 15 wives at the time. And what, around what years? So this is 1853 that he does this. This is after, I mean. Th- it's, it's a very, it's a very bifurcated <laughs> just, system because in, in America, you have this widespread PR campaign. This is part, this is why Pratt is sent to Washington, D.C., is as part of this, this PR campaign. But then in Europe, it's radio silence. So later on, there's this in the, her memoir, this British woman talks about how this girl comes to her with her tears in her eyes and says, is it true that Brigham Young has 90 wives? And so that's what's happening is these people are hearing these rumors, but at the same time, the leaders there in Europe are still denying that it happened, which, I mean, you can on one hand, you can see why they're doing it, but on the other hand, it is very detrimental to their cause. And... It will get better towards the end of the, the century, but for a while there, it's Europe is rough, whereas it had been this hotbed of missionary activity and conversion before. How do I know histor, historians aren't in the business of trying to understand people's motives or even assessing someone's character, but that seems particularly dark and egregious for the, the third prophet president of the Mormon church, John Taylor, to be actively practicing polygamy very actively. How many wives? 15 at that point. 15 wives. And he's a missionary telling all the people who are inquiring that no polygamy is going on. Do you have it? Do we have any indication how he justified that in his own mind? Yeah, we have it in our scriptures. When you have the story of Nephi cutting off the head of Laban, what we learn is that the good guy, Nephi, who cuts off the head of a guy to get a record because the ends justify the means, that sometimes you got to do some bad things and get your hands dirty for the good work. And you have these leaders, it, and they understand this. They did this public-private thing in Nauvoo. Some of them go, oh, I see the world isn't ready for this sacred doctrine and so we'll give them the the milk before the meat. And this becomes a pattern for John Taylor for a long, long time. This is not going to be the only time he tells the public one thing and, and does something else privately. It becomes a test. It becomes a higher a higher law is what they call it. So, you know, maybe these converts in, in England don't understand it yet. And that's okay because they're kind of wicked. They haven't been brought over to the, the real side yet. And this is still an idea that exists in fundamentalism, which is... Um, most of the conversions for, into fundamentalist polygamy are from the LDS people. They believe that we're the milk that can't handle the meat. The meat is the higher law. We're lower law. And uh, this is what justifies a lot of the lying. It becomes a sacred versus secret. I mean, I guess I just answered the question in my own mind. Joseph Smith lied about it until his death. So why wouldn't Brigham Young and John Taylor and others just feel okay lying about it if Joseph was the prophet. I mean, that's pretty obvious. One of the most cancerous parts of our culture is the idea that you can lie for the Lord. And you, we come up with a lot of names for it, but it is in the scriptures that sometimes you have to do hard, terrible things for God. And that is going to be a an idea that haunts our culture to this day. There's still people that believe that God's law trumps man's law. And you get that straight up from Joseph Smith, who did this many times, and not just with polygamy. You see this with his military actions. Sometimes the man's law is wicked and God's law is better. And that's exactly how they saw polygamy. I think part of it is is that distinction between the, the lesser laws and the higher laws. And the thought was that Zion is where the higher laws are. So in addition to plural marriage, they aren't talking a lot about temple things, and the thought was that you learn, the missionaries give you the start, you come, you gather design. That's a big part of it is the, the doctrine of the gathering. You get here, then you're introduced to these higher laws. The problem is, is then you have, going forward, you'll have a lot of Scandinavian immigrants, for example, who arrive here, have never heard of polygamy, and these women within a year or two are now married as the, the fourth wife, almost without knowing what's going on. And that leads to... A lot of problems, obviously, because you have not only these these cultural barriers, but you have language barriers. 
And so there are some some very rough stories of these women who end up in plural marriages that they were really not anticipating when they came here. And we have to we have to remember 1850s Utah. We do not have the railroad yet. We don't have the telegraph yet. We don't have a lot of things. There are no mail routes in the early 1850s. The the Pony Express doesn't happen until a little bit later. So people will get here, many of them on the PEF on borrowed money, and then they're stuck here. And I and I don't think modern people can understand the isolation that we're talking about. Your best bet if you got here to Utah and you changed your mind was to beg a federal soldier to get you out. And in the 1850s, we actually have many examples of that happening. Mass exoduses, hundreds of people begging soldiers. Oftentimes they are women trying to get out, but they're men too. And this is where we, you know, get a lot of the Danite activity, the Mormon Reformation stems from this parish Potter murders, all of this stuff where people that are, tr- they get here and they're like, this is not what I signed up for. This is not what I was told. And you have apostates, you know, several people that believed in Mormonism get here and they're like, wait a minute, this isn't cool. And they want to leave. And they'll say the perpetual immigration fund is, is a way to entrap people, that it's a scam. It's a way to keep people stuck here. And, you know, Brigham Young is experimenting with these ideas of, of consecration and united order for, you know, most of his tenure. And those are also ways to keep people there. Mormon, early Mormons in Deseret try to start their own language, their own money system, and it becomes like company scrip. Like if you've ever heard of the coal mining situations where people were paid in scrip, it kept them in poverty and it kept them loyal to their companies, which means you weren't getting paid regular American dollars. You were getting paid scrip. Well, we had tithing scrip. A lot of the interchange in commerce in in early Utah was tithing scrip. And all of the stores, Brigham Young controlled all the trade routes. He deliberately puts his homes um, by City Creek. He controls the the water. He um, controls the the trails. He has spies everywhere. He has men on outposts. He has power. So if you disagree with him, you're in real trouble. And these people that would leave in you know in the dark of night or in groups. Um, they would be raided. They would all of their stuff would be stolen, and their stories of people showing up um, to Fort Laramie or whatever with no shoes, starving and crying and bloody feet because the Mormons have come. And, and Brigham Young said it over the pulpit several times: "You can leave, but we're taking all your stuff." Mm-hmm. Recently, when all this uh, Operation Underground Railroad, Tim Ballard stuff, and just all of Utah was lit up with sex trafficking talk. I had Julia, I I had remembered my reading of the Nauvoo Expositor and how William Law's concerns with Joseph almost sounded like trafficking from the sense of missionaries going to Europe, bringing young women over, and then almost parceling them out as property. I know that presentism, to sort of take a term like trafficking and then project it back do you think that's going too far to to say that this feels like trafficking of women for sexual reasons or is that over overstretching i think women were trafficked all the time in the west they wouldn't have called it that but uh, often you know women that were widowed or orphaned were trafficked uh into prostitution that was one of the few ways women in the frontier could survive women couldn't own property they didn't have a lot of power outside of the men in their life and that was sort of mormon's reaction it, it, there becomes this discourse always mirroring prostitution and polygamy the church leaders are saying our women could be like that they could be like prostitutes or whores but we take care of our women right we're better than that uh, we marry them but women in polygamy, especially women that are leaving with the soldiers, are saying it's a whorehouse. And we'll talk about some examples of this. You do have women who, and especially the handcart companies, this is a good example, the most vulnerable women um, in the Willie Handcart Company, for example, are young and orphaned because a lot of the men die. A lot of the men are the ones in the sweet water river going, you know, and freezing to death and dying. And so it leaves a lot of orphaned girls and a lot of widows. So they come in and someone, I forget who it was, some, maybe it was Connell O'Donovan did a really good study on 
the marriage rates of the, those women that came over, really young girls, Woodruff, Wilford Woodruff gets one of his really young 13 or 14 year old brides from the handcart company. And uh, that one's controversial because she has a baby soon after. And so the common understanding was Wilford Woodruff like married this 13 or 14 year old girl, her age is kind of disputed and then gets her pregnant. But I actually think that on this particular case, she was probably already pregnant by who knows who uh, along the trail and Woodruff married her as, you know, to, to cover that up. But it doesn't change the fact that these women, like Brian said, Scandinavian women, especially women that didn't speak English, were particularly vulnerable. Uh, a lot of the stories in early Utah, you'll hear them, they'll come over, they'll arrive in Salt Lake City, they'll be placed as a maid in someone's house to work off their perpetual immigration debts. And pretty soon they're offered to be a third or fourth or fifth or 16th wife to someone. And the people around them are like, you got a good one. You got John D. Lee, take him. You know, he's a man of prominence or status. And this happens to many women. And this is how the women get carted off. And as we get into the Mormon Reformation, that's really when the marriages ramp up. But yeah, I, th I, I actually, you know, this presentism thing, is interesting because every time people use that, we're still going off our limited, um, you know, comparison of the past. Human nature is human nature. And again, I like to remind people that there were still laws that existed. There were still uh, things that made these things considered bad, which is why the Mormons were in so much trouble. So when people are like, it was different. Everybody just married 14 year olds then. That is not true. There has been a great, Scott Barrett sent me this great study the other day on civil war marriages. The civil war uh, kills off a lot of men, a lot of men, and leaves this vacuum for women on the East Coast. And meanwhile, you have all these men coming, minors and stuff coming to the West Coast, and it's all men. So th there were these gender um, imbalances in the country, and Utah is creating its own with polygamy, but the average age f is still like 21 for women and 26 for men. And this is in spite of all of those barriers. So this idea that like it's cool to marry a 13-year-old it wasn't cool. And we know it's not cool because you see discourses between the the elders talking about this isn't cool. When John D. Lee marries Anne Gorge, one of his youngest wives, family places her as old as 17. She says she was 13 when she was married to him. People in Salt Lake disapproved of their marriage. As they're going through, they're like, why is he with this young girl? That's not presentism. People saw it as bad. And... Uh, they also understood that it was a frontier and people didn't have resources. So, yeah, I think girls were trafficked here. Um, boys were trafficked, too. Um, men were trafficked as laborers and, you know, tricked into when you're when you're brought somewhere with the promise of one thing and given something else. What would you call that? Yeah. All right. Well, that's um, that's important stuff. So. All right, so Orson Pratt is making his noise in 18, 1852. Does he end up withdrawing or retracting that? Is he told to be quiet? Like, do the crow, or is that the outing? Is that the big outing of polygamy? And by the way, the Doctrine and Covenants still had Section 101 at the time, right? Right, we're still 25 years oh, away from okay, it going in. Okay, okay. Um, Brigham will tell him to shut up because that was one of his favorite things to do. <laughs> but it was it was almost more of a Brigham Orson conflict than it was talking about polygamy necessarily because Brigham is constantly talking about it as are most of the other leaders through this period, and so what happens is Washington is getting increasingly nervous about this important way station to the gold fields and Oregon and the West that's so important, and so they they are trying to exert more federal influence here, and so there are federal appointees that will come to Salt Lake that are duly appointed and get here, Brigham doesn't want to deal with them. And they are, and importantly, they're bringing money with them, federal funds that are badly needed. This is a desert economy. They're struggling and they really need that money. And all they need to do is to cooperate with the duly appointed federal officials, but they hate them and they will not cooperate. And it gets so bad that a group of them that'll be known as the runway officials just leave and are like, I'm not dealing with this, this is awful. And say so that they go back East and tell how awful they have been treated. 
and this just ramps up the pressure more. All the while, men like John Bernheisel, who are back there trying to smooth things over, are saying, guys, you can't do this. Like, you can't just do whatever you want out there. This isn't going to work. And so we see as the 1850s go along, this, this pot that's boiling in Utah just keeps going. And along the way, we have other things like drought and cricket infestations and all these other things that are making it really, really problematic. And then the response to all of these things and, and, and the religious tensions is a period called the Mormon Reformation, which I would not even pretend to steal from Lindsay as it is one of her favorite things. It is, this is this time period. Wait, really is, quick, do we want to talk about Albert Carrington and the Hawaiian mission or? Oh yeah, I think you should take, I'll, I'll give the background, but then you tell the, the goods because. Uh, and also we have polygamy as a requisite for leadership. Oh yeah, okay. So 1848, territorial legislature, Brigham Young gives his first introduction to what could be argued as blood atonement. So people don't realize this, but for a long, long time, way too long in Utah, the Constitution allowed beheading as an acceptable uh, punishment to a lot of things. Utah or the... Utah. Okay. Utah Constitution, the territorial... I knew about the firing squad. I didn't know about the... Yeah, no, beheading, beheading. was beheading was the thing. So he's what talking the... about beheading, um, and he uses blood atonement language in 1848. And I say that because... There are several missions now that happen in the Pacific, and one of them is in Hawaii, and we cover this in great detail because it's it's an important thing. Mormons, you know, really do their part to bring smallpox to kill off thousands mm. of indigenous Hawaiians. Oh, no. Um, and the, the missionaries are super gross there. Like, there's still a long-awaited uh, rumor that Joseph F. Smith, Hiram's son, he was 15 when he first gets called on. He was a troubled boy after his father died. He comes to Utah really angry, getting into fights. His mom dies. They, uh, so they sent him on a mission to Hawaii, and it says he probably impregnated um, at least one of the girls there. Uh uh, a that, wife or not a wife? Not a wife. The missionaries were sleeping with the women and molesting the women, assaulting the women, whatever you want to, raping the women. Um, and so Albert Carrington is an example of this. What women? Uh, indigenous, indigenous Hawaiian oh, women. Oh, yeah. dang. Like, uh, we, caught, we talk about this. Uh, they get into trouble doing this. Do you want to talk about that and talk about Carrington? I'm just, uh, so Carrington's just, a little later. So we'll, sorry. We'll, Who's the guy that blood atones? Uh, Hiram Clark. Hiram so Clark. Tell him the Hiram Clark story. Clark is an interesting man. He has had red flags before, and he gets to Hawaii and is the mission president, and the elders are troubled by him. He's he's clearly got some mental health challenges going on, and he's doing some very odd things. He's got some interesting ideas around sexuality. And he finally can't take it and goes back to California, just kind of abandons his, his post. And uh, it's painted various ways by family. But one account is thought that he, he dies by suicide as sort of a way to atone for his misdeeds in Hawaii. And it's a very sad, ugly Messy story. He clearly mm. suffers from sort suffers. He clearly commits some sort of sexual transgression, sexual sin, sexual assault. That's bad enough that he feels bad enough that he travels back to San Francisco and he blood atones himself in front of his own son. And so, um, so that's why I think. Does that mean he kills himself or he oh, kills himself oh my in front of his own son? Oh my goodness. Um, Albert Carrington's a perv for another time. <laughs> Sorry, I get them mixed up. Every ear has its own one. <laughs> but I, I bring this up because the missionaries, like these these guys were doing stuff like Parley Pratt. There are stories of Parley Pratt and other missionaries that have their hands, like they're on their missions and they've got their hands up the skirts of women sitting on their laps. And these are married men. Um, and so in Hawaii, what's interesting is this is, they start and they go over before polygamy is announced, but after it's announced, you have a lot of the missionaries that come over from their mission, come back to the Utah period, and Utah is now just getting started. And later on, they're going to bring these things to, way later on, to different islands in Polynesia, including New Zealand, where you have a lot of fundamentalist lore that starts uh, with polygamy in the islands. And a lot of them justify it by saying, you know, these are Lamanite women. Um, there's some debate on their lineage too, but 
that they can uh, marry these women. And so some of them, Amanda Komodo has done some work on, you know, uh, women from the islands who've been married as plural wives who they try to take back here. But we just thought that was worth mentioning that Mormonism is still going out into the world as they're settling in Utah. Yeah, like, you know, I remember the primary song of the Latter-day Prophets, you know, Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, right? Are you like, going to remember the F, John? Yeah, remember Will you the remember F? the F? Yeah, Joseph F. Smith remembered the Good. F. Good. Like, you're just, you're, 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 this story is kind of destroying my idealistic perceptions of all of them. So we've got John Taylor as a polygamist lying to the, you know, women out there in England. What did you just say about Wilford Woodruff? What did he, we just mentioned him, He right? married underage girls, but yeah, he would, we've got plenty of Woodruff fun coming up too. Yeah. And then we've got Joseph F. Smith impregnating native Rumors. That's a rumor. Okay. That's a rumor that we cannot, but you know, he. I would say it's not implausible. It's not implausible because we know that they were sleeping around with. Um, indigenous Hawaiian women. You just don't think of your Mormon prophets doing these sorts of things in their, you know, in their adulthood. Oh, yeah. They were all alcoholics, too. <laughs> okay. The, the, the <laughs> status of indigenous women and all this is very interesting because they're, mm. I mean, as a whole, in, in all of Mormon theology throughout the 19th century is very, they're, they're in this, this weird liminal space. They're in limbo because at some point, we, we're hearkening back to the 1831 revelation that Mormon man can marry them, and then they will become white and delights them, that idea. But other points, the thought thing is swings more to, no, they shouldn't be involved in polygamy or temple ordinances. That's part of it, too. And so all along the way, their status is being redefined and changed and hashed out, and it's, it's never good, but it's constantly being redefined as we move along. Yeah. Well, I guess that's what makes your job so fun and a little dark, right? Is is learning all these tidbits. Yeah, there's there's a lot. <laughs> the so, Hawaiian mission actually I listen to our episode on it because it's outside of just polygamy, there's some crazy crazy stuff that happens. Well, the I, I we talked about Albert Carrington in the episode we did. Yes, when right? Gary was here. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Do you just want to get him out of the way <laughs> since I brought him up at the wrong time? Um, sure, because it does play into the the idea of shenanigans during missions. He, so, he is before the Reformation in your outline. Uh, he, he's That's later. That's my fault. Oh, oh That's okay. my fault. He's oh, British. Do, I'll get bring him up later. Yeah, we'll, we'll put him in. Well, you know, let's just talk about it right now because okay. he doesn't necessarily fit well in okay. that period okay, because it's, it. it's in Britain. But This is okay. just our pervy mission story. Okay, okay. He's the mission president. Because I do remember him later in the 1800s. Yeah, okay. So there had been red flags in Salt Lake, but they don't seem to have been too many and they don't, they didn't have any effect. So it's while he's president of the British mission that the problems really start happening and it doesn't come out until he comes home and his successor is John Henry Smith and he gets there and he starts getting story after story that Carrington has been really handsy with the staff at the mission home. And several of these women will, will emigrate to Utah and more of the story comes out. But Carrington keeps denying to his brethren who initially want to say, well, they're just rumors. They're pr it's just slander, right? This is the, the persecution complex that really comes back. And so over time, they start hearing more and more and more. And finally, the, the lies start to, to crumble. And... Once his colleagues realize the extent of what's happened, they are horrified. And Carrington has... What's that horrified? Presentism. <laughs> Carrington People has come up People cared about that stuff back then? <laughs> what? It took, it took some time. It took convincing. They had to really be told <laughs> multiple times before they would finally listen. Because Carrington has come up with some interesting ideas that are uh, graphic theology... His, his basic idea, as long as he doesn't ejaculate in the women, no harm, no foul. He, it's a little folly in Israel is the term that's used. Also a term at BYU, folly in Israel. <laughs> uh, Mormons have long been creative about how they go about things, and they were no different in the 19th century. And so once they realize how bad it is, they finally excommunicate him. But it, you know, and it takes... 
letters to all of the 12 where they essentially vote by letter what to do with them. And he's excommunicated. He immediately, he doesn't seem to think any of this is wrong. He was an apostle, right? He was an apostle, yeah. longtime apostle. And he's an interesting guy too, because he was much better educated than most of his colleagues. He had worked in the historian's office. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just an ugly, terrible, gross story. And he wants to be rebaptized and they don't want to let him. And there's differing feelings on how to handle his case. And he is rebaptized, but that's about it, and dies a sad, gross, lonely old man for the most part. And tell him the name of Gary Berger, Berger's book that you edited, If you want right? to know more about this story, and you should, uh, a book called Justice and Mercy, one of the chapters is on this whole story, incredibly well documented by Gary. It's basically about so, naughty apostles. You want to learn about naughty apostles. If you want the naughty stories, Gary's <laughs> book is... It's fascinating. Richard Lyman's in there. Richard Lyman's yeah. in there. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very interesting. Okay. All yeah. right. Got that out of the way. There's Albert Carrington's <laughs> due, his 15 <laughs> minutes of infamy. I still find myself trying to like say, oh no, Lindsay, you said pervy apostles, like people aren't going to listen to you anymore. And I'm trying to eradicate that thinking because if you're out there and you're not listening to me because I said pervy apostles and you're like, she's biased. You're damn right I'm biased. What else would you call a guy that goes on a mission and molests people so bad that he kills himself for it? Or Albert Carrington, who lies to many people, his wife, his his wives, his friends, and does this. Like, can we stop? Like, if if you have faith in your tradition, if you love Mormons like I do, call it for what it is. We're all people. We all make mistakes. And if we try to you know, excuse leaders from this stuff. I'm telling you, I see the real effects in communities today. So sorry for the, the preachiness, but I, I still find myself going like, oh no, I called it pervy. It is pervy. One of his colleagues will say, we listened to the most disgusting recitations from the old man's lips. They agreed. And I will say to their credit, once they understand the extent of it, they treat it just like they would anybody. They publish the notice in the Deseret News. You know, they don't allow him to be rebaptized and restored immediately. So they do handle it like they would anyone, even though he is one of their colleagues. So I will say once they finally decide to listen, I think they did act uh, fairly how they would anyone else. There was no special treatment for him. Yeah, but but usually people in power want to avoid punishing other people in power just to avoid the scandal. Yep. So their arms have to kind of be twisted behind their back to force them to punish one of their own. I mean, that's kind of the old boys network kind of thing, right? Yeah. Okay, and then you had as a last point um, polygamy as a prerequisite for leadership. Right? Is that right before the Mormon Reformation? Yeah, this starts to grow throughout the 1850s. And at this point, I think of it kind of like Boyd Packer's unwritten order of things. Like there's no rule, but it's more or less understood that's kind of how it works. If you want to be a bishop, if you're going to be a stake president, anyone in a prominent position, you need to be a polygamist. 30 years later, it will definitely become canonized, not in English, but it, it's there. And so there are a few exceptions. One of our favorites is the pirate bishop, Samuel Woolley, there with his earring. An but, eye patch. That's why it's a pirate. Uh, but no, the, just kidding. It's just an earring. Just an earring. It's enough. But there, those exceptions are rare. There aren't very many of them. And so that, that, will, that will just keep growing toward the end of the 19th century. And if, if people are in positions where they aren't, they will be leaned on to become polygamous, to live that higher law. And there's a lot of social pressure that gets applied to these men if they don't want to. And there are some that don't. And John Smith, who's the presiding patriarch, is a very reluctant polygamist. His wife's right along there with him. And so we do see stories like that, but they're, they're fairly uncommon. But certainly for a good portion of this, this time period, the Quorum of the Twelve are all polygamous. Many times over. Okay. And that wouldn't change until Heber J. Grant's death. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, as I've been reading Barbara and, Turley, Barbara and Richard Turley's book, The Mormon Reformation is a, is a really important time period that sort of ushers in a lot of things, including <laughs> the Mountain Meadows Massacre. <laughs> so how do we introduce it? Because I don't know a lot about it. 
So uh, I'm back to the 1850s, uh, where the state of Deseret, the church is going to try seven times to get a bid for statehood. And they have a hard time. And just as an example, it's not that hard to become a state. Nevada petitions is a territory for like only two years and then becomes a state. It's polygamy that stops Utah from becoming a state. In 1852, the territorial legislature uh, votes in slavery and Indian slavery. They sort of legalize it. Um, And that does some interesting things with the tribal relations. So I I bring that up because... um, it's going to come in later. Wakara is the Ute chief, and he's really running a slave trade. The Utes were slavers um, for several centuries. Ned Black, Blackhawk, who is an indigenous scholar, says, you know, as a way to sort of deal with in colonization, folks like Wakara decide to take advantage of it, and they become slavers. So the Utes would go and steal often Navajo, Shoshone, um, go shoot children and sell them to Mormons. And of course, you know, Brigham Young in 1852 doesn't really like this, but he decides that maybe Mormons can buy Indian children as a way to help them and maybe fulfill the promises of the Book of Mormon. And that will translate to plural wives later on in the Utah period. Um, 1854, 1855, we have a few things. We have the crickets and the grasshoppers. We have the drought. We have a terrible winter. Their crops fail. It's a really, really hard time. Um, People are struggling and people are getting out of Utah in in mass. They're going to soldiers. They're begging to get out. And Brigham's dealing with a lot of um, disloyalty and he doesn't like it. And at the same time, there are uh, growing conflicts with the Shoshone to the north of the church. And so there are some and, and to the Utes uh, sort of south of Mormons. And so the there are some conflicts that break out and some massacres that happen, including um, the Gunnison Massacre, where some soldiers who are coming across basically are massacred by some Shoshone. So the government says, we're going to send some federal soldiers out to investigate. So they're sending federal soldiers to Utah. Meanwhile, Utah is losing, Brigham is losing power. He's losing trust. And as soldiers come into Utah, uh, Mormons petition them and say, help us. You got to get us out of here. We need help. We want to get out. Brigham doesn't like this. And so one of my favorite stories leading up to the Mormon Reformation is the Steptoe Expedition. We always talk about Johnson's army, the Utah Expedition, the great thing that starts off the 1857 war. But a couple years before this happens, the Steptoe Expedition um, comes across their federal soldiers that are sent to investigate the Gunnison Massacre and to do a few other things. And they arrive in Utah. Steptoe is going to replace uh, Brigham Young. He's now 54. He's he's done his uh, term. He's done his first four years as governor. And uh, the federal government wants Colonel Steptoe to step in and replace Governor Young. Steptoe doesn't want to do it. So he concedes to Young. And he, General Steptoe does a good job at kind of making the Mormons like him. The problem is his soldiers are now frequenting and they're bored and they're in Salt Lake City. They're going to brothels. They're going to dances. They're going to saloons. They're bringing hundreds of thousands of dollars into the economy of Salt Lake City. But the women are starting to escape with the soldiers. And this hits close to home with several of the apostles. One of Heber's wives leaves with one of the expeditions. What? Yep. Uh, This is where I always say you can see Heber's rhetoric become really sexist after this. This is where he starts saying women can't be trusted. Women are whores. Women, you need to watch your wives, lock them up. You know, these, he doesn't say that exactly, but he says a lot of terrible things about women after, you know, the soldiers steal away his wives. My favorite story in Mormon history is the story of Brigham Young's daughter-in-law, Mary Ayers Young. She was said to be a beautiful young woman. She was married to his son, Joseph Young. And he's off on a mission, and uh, the Steptoe expedition comes into town. And we know this because we have letters from the soldiers writing to their friends back east. One of the soldiers, his name is Sylvester Mowry, he goes to a dance, and he meets a Mary Ayers Young, and he falls in love with her. He actually says in his letter to his friend, she's the hottest young thing you could ever get or something. Like, he said, he calls her hot. He actually says that word. He's and young. He's single. He's he, having a good time. He's having a good Utah. time. He, he says she's the most beautiful girl he's ever seen, and he said, and Brigham Young, 
when he saw us soldiers, he he looked like we would F U C K our way through town. Perhaps we will, he says. In Wait, his they used that word back then? Of course they did. Yeah. What? Yeah. It's not presentism. They actually did. Um, so <laughs> so he's writing these letters back and they fall in love and she says she's the one that calls, according to him, that she's living in a brothel. She says, I'm trapped here. I don't want to be here. I Salt Lake is the biggest brothel in the United States. Uh, please get me out. So they make a plan to run away. Um, Brigham Young gets word of this and he puts a hit out on Maori. And Maori, Steptoe's like, oh, man, I'm trying really hard with Brigham Young. So he sends Maori out to Tooele Valley, Rush Valley, in the middle of nowhere. And then we're seeing his letters there as he's going to attempt to run away with Brigham Young's daughter-in-law. Brigham Young allegedly has this armed guard in the Lion House. They, they hold her up with this armed guard, and she's not able to escape. And eventually Maori goes to California with um, some other women. I guess he was a fickle heart, but... Um, yeah, I, that story is so great because it ends up with these soldiers having a confrontation where there's a hundred soldiers in downtown Salt Lake and a hundred Mormons, and they're about to go to war, and it's called off last minute, and there's no brawl. But uh, this is where it starts. These these the federal government comes in to investigate stuff, and they start taking women. And the Mormons do not like their women taken. And so they get really paranoid. And so that happens before Johnston's army. And there are several other um, detachments that come across. And it's the same kind of thing. Every time you have soldiers coming, you have people, especially women, wanting to leave with the soldiers. And often they do. Because you have a lot of these lonely plural wives. Many of them are young, married to old men, whose husbands are on missions. And these young horny soldiers that come into town that are going to dances and, you know, have all this promise. And so that is one of the, the things that I don't think gets enough credit for this conflict. Um, you also have a lot of other interesting things happen. Parley Pratt now is on a mission. He falls in love with a woman named Eleanor McLean. She's married. She claims her husband's abusive and a drunk. His name's Hector. She runs off uh, to be a plural wife of Parley Pratt. Hector McLean, in one of the greatest, you know, Wild West stories of all time, chases him down cross country to Arkansas in the spring of 1857 and murders Parley Pratt in cold blood for stealing his wife. And this really plays into the massacre. So you have a lot of things happening. But right before 1857, Brigham Young decides, what am I going to do with this apostasy? And he starts the Mormon Reformation. And with that, uh, do you want to tell us about Jedediah Grant really quick? Can, can I ask you a really quick question? Then we'll go right to Jedediah Grant. Sure. How is, if Brigham Young is the governor um, for a lot of this time and he's the prophet and he has all the power in Salt Lake City, how is there allowed to be a brothel? Well, he's not dumb. He's a good businessman, and he knows that, you know, what soldiers want. And prostitution is everywhere in the Old West, including amongst his own saints, as we learned with Garden Grove. But you think he could have stamped it out? He could have just always got his police or security officers or whatever and ran them out of town? Well, and we're going to talk about the time that they do that uh, with the church least uh, brothel. <laughs> but uh, no, right as right from the get go, like as soon as soldiers arrive uh, min or minors, you have the 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 sex commercial sex work. It's I just, just wonder whether it. he was willing to turn a blind eye to that, even amongst his own saints. I wonder if there was some sort of that's just the way it was back then. And even faithful, righteous leaders knew that those places existed and felt like they were either unavoidable or maybe an important part of the social order? Brigham's kind of of two minds about what all this means, because on the one hand, they, they want to be isolated, but they can't be. And that's increasingly clear that they're not going to be isolated. And so these he they like the money coming in to the economy because they are very poor, especially cash poor. It's essentially a trade economy. But at the same time, they don't love the elements that come with it. But also you have to think that also provides a pretty good foil to be mad about that them coming in. So there's a lot of things going on. I mean, on. I guess you need an enemy to always 
rail against and fight against. And that leads very well into the Reformation. Okay. All right. Because they leaders feel like there is this spiritual depression going on. And so and with this lack, this increasing lack of isolation with the world coming in, the Gentiles are coming here. We need to recommit ourselves to the basics of Mormonism. And a lot of this is due to his counselor, Jedediah Grant, who is this absolute firebrand at the podium. And he starts this campaign of visiting the settlements and just ripping them up, up one side and the other. And you get reports of, of Wilford Woodruff talking about him raining pitchforks down on the congregation. And Brigham is more or less kind of letting him, Jedediah drive the Reformation bus and cheering him on the whole way. And the rhetoric gets pretty ugly. And this is where we start to see the themes of blood atonement really crop up. And for our never Mormons, maybe just to find that really quick. So this is such a fascinating topic because there are definitely hints of it with Joseph Smith. We kind of hinted at this earlier. So there's a fascinating discussion that happens in Nauvoo in 1843. And there is a national case of a hanging. And they're sitting around at the office talking about it. And George A. Smith says, I don't think I like hanging. And Joseph Smith says, I don't either. I think we should shoot them or we should slit their throats. And then he uses this fascinating phrase. He says, and then we'll let the smoke ascend up to heaven. And this is probably drawing on Revelation language in the, in the New Testament, where the, the incense that's used in, in the ritual is the, the prayer of, of the saints rising to heaven. And he sort of repurposes this, this imagery to this blood that people spill for their own sins is now an offering. And the idea is there are certain sins that go beyond the pale of, of Jesus's atonement. And so there's some that you have to have your own blood shed. Now, it's not always clear whether that means you doing it yourself, like the Hiram Clark story, or whether that's sort of like others doing it to you. And we get the height of it is February 1857, Brigham Young preaches that say someone in the community commits this, this sin that is just beyond the pale. Will you love that man or woman enough to shed their blood? And then he says, that is what Jesus meant. That is quite the statement. Mm -hmm. And that will be forever debated of whether that's rhetoric, that's just rhetoric, or he really means it. And the problem is, is he never really defines what if he's just talking or if he really means you to do that. And so as a result, we get some stories that are clearly people listening to things like this and saying, he means do that, and they do it. And how many of them and who does it are hotly debated. But it's clear that people are not always just hearing it as rhetoric. That much is clear. And um, we actually have our, our friend... Mike Homer is working on a book for Signature down the road a little bit that will be a good history of blood atonement, which we definitely need. So the height of the Reformation, 1856, right? We've Everyone has suffered. It's a terrible time. This is where you're eating the sago lily bulbs, you know, every, the seagulls, the crickets, all of that, which is kind of a myth. But um, it's a hard time. Brigham Young tries several things. One of the interesting things is he holds a contest where they, you know, want to kill all the vermin in, that are eating the crops. And so he puts a, a script, a money count on the heads of of the vermin. And um, basically it's a hunting contest for all the settlements. And, you know, you kill a coyote, you get this much points. You kill so, um, a squirrel, you get this many points. And uh, the Mormons kill hundreds of thousands of animals that radically shifts the ecology of the place. And so when we're talking about colonization, the Mormons aren't just displacing, you know, um, indigenous Utes and sending them somewhere else. They're taking their food sources. They're disrupting the ecology. Uh, Virginia Kearns talks about this in her book about Sally Kanash, that this is colonization, bringing in all these foreign plants. Um, it radically shifts the way that these people have been hunting and gathering for hundreds of thousands of years. Um what it also does, too, is it creates this idea of scarcity, and Brigham Young takes advantage of this. He starts the Reformation. It's a deliberate 
rebranding of Mormonism. And he uses uh, Jedediah Grant, who's Heber J. Grant's father. They called him Brigham Sledgehammer, even though he was this tiny, thin little guy. It starts in... Um, in Dave, it was now Davis County, Farmington area, Kaysville. They uh, have a sermon and they say, you're all dirty and wicked and that's why we're suffering. That's why we're starving. And um, this is why the Gentiles are thriving and we're not. So let's all get rebaptized. 500 people step up and they start getting rebaptized. And eventually hundreds and hundreds more are going to get rebaptized um, to sort of renew their commitment to Mormonism. This is where we get the idea of home teachers that start. Uh, Brigham Young develops a whole list of catechisms, like Catholic catechisms, that these home teachers, two by two, are going to go to every house in every settlement and ask you if you are obeying these things. And some of them are just practical things, like do you bathe every day? Do you feed your cattle? But some are how loyal are you? Are you paying your tithing? These kind of things. And um, it gets to be so out of control, so zealous that even Brigham Young's own wives uh, or, or friends start to go, I don't know about this. I mean, there's a story that Eliza or Snow and Lorenzo of Snow, who are like these nerdy poets and scholars, they start the Polysophic Society where they want to get together and discuss literature. And Jedediah Grant like tells them it's, or Heber, was it Heber, Heber Kimball criticizes them and tells them that, you know, it's it's too wicked and it's, you know, too inappropriate. And Hannah Tatfield King, who is part of this society, goes, well, Heber Kimball would know about inappropriate. <laughs> you know, she like starts to criticize them because they're like, whoa, guys, it's going too far. There's a story that happens in the Bowery where uh, Jedediah Grant is asking everyone to confess their sins and people start getting up and yelling sins that they don't even commit. And then they start beating each other and whipping each other with rods and sticks to curse their sins. And it's just madness. It just gets out of control. And this is sort of the, the rhetoric that we're talking about, the blood atonement. They... Jedediah Grant is asking to form committees to decide who gets to be blood atoned. And again, the idea is some sins are that Jesus's atonement can't cover. You have to shed your own blood and the blood has to be spilt to the ground as an offering. And uh, so whether it's whether it's literal or not doesn't matter because it's taken literal by many, many people. Um Springville is a particular hotbed of the Reformation, and you have the police, the, the police in Springville. Um, there's this horrible story about, like, ask they go and catechize everybody, and there's a guy there that says, well, you know, I don't wash my hands as often as I should, or I don't want to wash my hands or something, or I don't wash my food. And the police bring him out, set him at a public table, and they all surround him with guns until he like washes his hands or something. It's like out of control. And he eventually gets out of Dodge because he's like, this is crazy. So it was a scary time. And, and this is where you start hearing about castrations. You hear about young boys. Um, this is still, you know, very hotly debated in the Mormon community because um, it's not well documented. But we do have documentation of like Bishop Warren Snow, who goes way back to the Missouri period. He um, is a bishop now in the Manti area. And it's said that he had a young boy castrated. Um, th there's debate on why. The most common story is that the young man wanted to marry a girl that Warren Snow wanted for his wives. But Porter Rockwell and Bill Hickman will say that they castrated people for sexual sins. Um, there's, there are several stories around Southern Utah at this time, too, that, you know, you'll be castrated for if you don't play play ball, if you will. Sorry for the I didn't mean it to be a pun. But anyway, so it's it's just a terrible time. And then you've got like the Parish Potter murders, people who are who flee the con the the country and are tracked down and killed. Um, Polly Aird has done a really great uh, look at apostates who are trying to leave during this time and what happens to them. Their barns are getting burned down. Um, people are getting hunted down and killed. And sometimes you'll have people that will leave the territory and they are killed by the Cheyenne or something, by indigenous, you know, uh, raiders. And people don't know. It, was it Danitz that tracked him down or was it something else? It was a crazy time. And this is where, as this is happening, you know, the, the government is starting to get wind of some of these stories, some of these murders, some of these conflicts. And they're like, we've is are Mormons going to rebel? Now, at the end of 1850, you've got 
a huge problem happening in the country where you've got the civil war is going to be started. So they're already dealing with rebellion from southern states. So they don't know what to do about this Utah thing. So they send a big detachment out. Uh, This is Johnson's army, the Utah expedition. And at this point, after the Reformation, Brigham Young has tried to maintain control. And what he's done is He's now isolated people even more. He's got more power and control than ever, and he's in his second term as territorial governor. Well, um, as the massacre and things happen, but right before the massacre, uh, the government says, I don't know about this guy. We're starting to hear that it's getting out of control. Let's send this, this government over to see Brigham Young hears about that and decides to go to war basically against the government. And so the the apocryphal story is it's July 24th, 1857. It's the centennial year of centennial, 10 years, (laughs) 10 Mm -hmm. years since they arrived in the Valley and they go up to Silver Lake. Have you been to Silver Lake? No. It's, it's a beautiful lake. You can just go walk up there. I, I like to think about this because they hold this 10-year celebration. They pull out their old pioneer clothes. They wear them. They sleep in the tents that they slept in when they came in the valley. They recreate. They're celebrating Pioneer Day. They put a big American flag on the mountain peak. And they're celebrating their running drills. And it's said that Porter Rockwell and several other writers come riding in to these 2,000 people and say, guess what? the federal government is coming to go to war against us. Brigham Young sends everybody home and they start preparing for war. This is July, 1857 from July until the end of 18, the year of 1857, 1858, even we have what is almost known as like the Utah war where they say there weren't very many deaths, but there were at least 200 people, including the Baker Fancher party that, that get, brutally massacred as a result of this fear and paranoia. So I think that kind of leads us into that. All right. So before we jump to the Utah war, I think Brian, there are a few more points about uh, the Mormon reformation time period that you wanted to cover. Maybe let's start with marriage rates and Brigham Young making money. This is part of a larger problem, which is that the Mormon reformation has been kind of ignored in scholarship At this point, we don't have a single book just about the Reformation, which is unfortunate. Hmm. We do have a master's thesis that is good, but it's like 50 years old at this point. And one of the things that he includes there is this this statement from Stan Ivins, an earlier researcher. And he says, if our tabulations are a true index, he says, there were the rate of marriages was 65% higher during 1856 and 57 than any other two-year period. And that's a point where Kip in the back of your head says, Napoleon, how can anyone even know this? Because to know that, you have to know the rates for all the other two-year periods. And there's just no way of knowing that. We don't have the data for it. Now, and that's a, that's a, a claim that gets repeated over and over in, in, in other things about the Reformation. The, it clearly was important. And that was part of the, the, uh, the rhetoric that's getting pushed. We have this really interesting letter from the wife of John Smith, the presiding patriarch, Helen Fisher, writing to a friend who says, every girl from the age of 10 years to 18 years old is being snapped up during this period. So I read, I read a a Gentile account saying you put a dress on a, on a fence post and it'll get married up. So, I mean, I, I'm the, the big numbers 10 that they were maybe not marrying 10 year olds, but at least like arranging or planning their ultimate fate? Is that what we're saying here? I haven't seen very many, I I haven't seen any 10 year old marriages. Uh, Connell O'Donovan, like I said, has done some research on underage marriages. He calls it pedagogy, uh, polygamy and pedophilia basically. And there are instances as young as 12 that we know of. I, I could 10 year olds have been married or promised yeah, it's it's possible. We just don't have good documentation on that. I think more as, as the Reformation steps up, one of the numbers I heard was 64% of all marriages that occurred in polygamy happened in those two years. So it's, yeah, the, the numbers are funny. And it, people are not honest. Scholars have not done a good uh, data dump on how many 
people were being married at all in polygamy. But we do know that it is a numbers game. And of course, in the 1850s, the Mormons were fudging the census numbers so they could get uh, more federal funding and for their bid for statehood. So we don't actually know exactly how many people, but we do know that as men married and were called to bring home more wives, I mean, the rhetoric really was like, if you don't marry plurally, you're going to lose your whole family and the family you've got. If you don't have more wives, you'll lose the one you've got. And so a lot of people are trying to get married as fast as they can to to do this. And of course, Brian can talk about this, but Brigham Young was charging for these marriages. Uh, one of the f- Wait, he would make money? Of course. Yeah, yeah. No, this was an enterprise. Um, he Whoa, To perform no the ceremony from Brigham Young was a special deal and people would often offer him gold pieces, silver pieces, but it was also, uh, there was a fee. There was like a marriage fee t- to get married. And so they were making money of, off that too. And one of the things people have to understand, and this is a lot of the work that I do with film now, when we're talking about Old West and when it comes to Mormons is it's like the Wild West, except the Mormons run the probate court. So instead of sheriffs, you have bishops, basically. Um, so at this time, the whole legal system in the Utah Territory is run by bishops. So uh, anything from crimes to marriages is being handled by ecclesiastical leaders. And so Brigham is in control of everything. And I think people don't understand that enough. To understand a community, you really do have to understand the laws that are that are happening. And I used to be really bored by legal history, but our friend John Dinger, who's a legal historian, has done some fantastic work on like the probate courts in Utah and the crimes and, and the punishments of this time period. And it really does factor into polygamy. You get sometimes men who are accused of molesting un- underage girls And they deal with that in a variety of different ways. Sometimes they'll marry the girls to their abuser, or sometimes the the man will be punished, you know, in the courts for it, in an ecclesiastical court. He'll be cut off, or he'll be given a fine or something like that. So there are a variety of ways of doing this, but it does show that underage marriages, even though, like, again, as you're marrying the you're marrying all the 18 year olds, then you're marrying the 17 year olds, you're running out of 17 year olds, then 16 year olds, it starts to get where people are like, whoa, whoa, whoa this is getting out of control. And I think that that, of course, is remedied by um, what happens in the 1860s. Okay. Um, do we want to talk about Anne Eliza Young? Is that, a, is that an important part she's of She's such a fascinating story, yeah. So she's born in Nauvoo, just right after Joseph Smith's death. And her father is a carriage maker. And so he's important in the local economy, but more importantly, he becomes close with Brigham Young. He's a friend of his. And so her father marries a plural wife right after she's born. And so she grows up in polygamy and she, it's not a happy household. Her mother has suicidal ideation along the way. It's, it's really not pleasant. And so that's kind of her formative experience is a not pleasant plural family. And so they come to Utah. She has a talent for the theater. And so she performs at the Salt Lake Theater. And Brigham Young watches her going back and forth from home and says, you know what? Why don't you just live at the Lion House? And it seems like he's already kind of got his eye on her at that point. She and the Lion me. House is? This is where Brigham and a lot of his wives will live, is in, in Salt Lake right next to his office. It's right there on Temple Square, right? Yep. Like they called him the Lion of the Lord. All these early leaders like to have uh, animals. John D. Lee had an <laughs> eagle over his place. They like to, you know, give themselves some sort of animal symbol, and he was a lion. Okay. It's still there. Go visit it. It's it's fascinating. I'm sure they give you a completely historically accurate They're not going to talk about Analyza too much during the tour, <laughs> unless it's changed, but that's that's why you're it's here better. today. It's better than okay. it used to be. <laughs> we went there uh, with with our friend, Mr. Nemo, when he was in town. Oh, yeah, so that's right. That was a lot of fun. That was fun because they were trying to tell Nemo, who comes from England... Like, this house is from the 1850s. Do you know how old that is? He was like, my apartment's older than this. <laughs> I've been in Nemo's apartment. <laughs> That's, yeah, that's fun. funny. It was, it was a fun tour. <laughs> so Anne meets, not surprisingly, someone her own age. And uh, Brigham kind of puts a, the kibosh on that. But she does end up marrying an actor who works with her at the, 
at the theater. It's not happy. They they uh, he's physically abusive, and he's. And the, and we've talked about this. We did a whole episode on her in on uh, Year of Polygamy, and the line between when a married plural husband is cheating on his first wife or courting a new plural wife, that line more or less doesn't exist. And so he's flirting with all the other women at the theater, and within the theology that she's presented with, Anne Eliza doesn't really have a lot of recourse. But eventually, thanks to help from her parents, she does get divorced. But then, so she's now this still very, very young woman who's very beautiful by all accounts and is, again, being pursued. And another man tries to marry her and Brigham Young shuts it down and finally realizes, okay, I, I need to do something. So he takes Ann Eliza for a walk and then has a talk with her father. And then he's married to her. And she's 24 at this point. She's still very young. And uh, it's an interesting relationship because it's Brigham Young's first plural marriage in three years. And so it clearly f- seems like he's gone out of his way to marry her. But it's not terribly happy. There are some accounts that he initially paid a lot of attention to her. And Eliza will say that he paid no attention to her. And so she chooses not to live at the Lion House, but to live at a cottage elsewhere in Salt Lake. And it's, it's a lonely existence. She takes in boarders to support herself. And one of them is this judge, non-Mormon, who is very friendly to her. And he slowly convinces her that, listen, you don't have to be trapped in this. You can, you can leave. And that, that plants the idea in her head that, that grows. And uh, she's unhappy religiously. And so the solution is, well, you need to go and be rebaptized, and that will sort of recommit yourself to Mormonism. She goes back to the endowment house where her marriage had been performed, and it's very unpleasant. She says everyone is just going through the routine, and that's sort of her religious turning point. And then she says, well, I got to make a living, so I need to make the boarding house more profitable. So she goes to Brigham Young and says, listen, I need a decent stove. And Brigham Young says, I have people coming in my office all day long asking for things. How can I do this? And that's the sort of turning point in the marriage for her. And Should have bought her the stove? Should have bought her the stove. <laughs> in hindsight, Brigham Young would have probably bought her a house and a stove and everything else because it's about to get real ugly. Hmm. So what happens is she leaves in the dead of night and she auctions off all of her stuff. And then she sues Brigham Young for divorce. She wants $1,000 a month in alimony. She wants $20,000 in court costs. She wants $200,000 from his future estate. She's not messing around. That's a lot of money back then. That's a lot. That's, that's a, lot that's of money a now. decent amount of money now. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, that's it. And Brigham Young says, hey, now listen, this marriage wasn't legal, so I owe you nothing. Mm. And the judge who's handling this, James McKean, is Brigham Young's avowed enemy. He hates McKean. McKean hates Brigham Young. He's handling the divorce. This is one case where the bishops don't get to handle it. And that works out for Ann Eliza. So, how is there a judge that Brigham doesn't approve of? How does that happen? In so, Brigham? by this point, oh. there, I have it's a been, theocracy. there have been enough federal appointees, um, and, and we'll get into this. This is part of the ramping up federal legislation against this. So, yeah, James McKean, uh, he, the, those two are constantly butting heads. And so, uh, it eventually will go to trial. And Brigham Young is, it's its brought down. He's ordered to pay $500 a month in alimony and $3,000 court costs. And he says, I will not do it. He spends a night in prison. He's then put on house arrest. And this is really interesting. I just sent Lindsay this. We discovered in Brigham Young Jr.'s journal where Brigham Young says he did pay some of the court costs. So I think there's still more to the story. But Brigham Young stalls, stalls, stalls. There's this revolving door of judges. James McKean gets removed. But then another one comes in, and the, the case goes back and forth. But ultimately, it is dismissed. However, Ann Eliza has had her say because she goes on this speaking tour. Um, P.T. Barnum originally wanted her in his company, and, and that doesn't happen. But she goes on a lecture tour through the Mountain West, but then she goes back to Washington, D.C. This is while the Congress is trying to pass federal legislation that will actually do something. And it seems like she's instrumental in the passing of the Poland Act in 1874 that we'll talk about later. But so even though Brigham Young technically won the case, it was ugly. 
And in the long term, Analyza seems to have been part of the federal legislation movement that will definitely impact Mormons down the road. Mm. So she's very important. And then uh, her kind lecture hero. Tour, yeah, and she turns it into a book that is wildly successful. Called? Wife uh, Number 19. Or yeah. The, yes, Wife Number 19. And that's like, uh, that's like Nauvoo Expositor William Law level courage, right? Maybe even more so. Oh, yeah. No, she was fiery. She wasn't in the 19th wife. So critics will be like, it's full of untruths. She wasn't even right. the 19th wife. But nobody knew what wife they were. <laughs> Her biographer said she was the we 27th wife. Yeah. She wasn't the 27th wife either. Yeah. Brigham Young's uh, wife list is very confusing, even to Brigham Young. What? Where was she likely? Higher, higher number? Because he was hiding wives or what? Is she, probably in the 20s. Um Okay. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, it's we, funny. We, we we looked into this and it's we in tried. It's in the 30s, I think, because it's, yeah. it's toward the end. He only marries, I think, two or three more wives. And the last one is Hannah Tapfield King, who is such a fascinating Part woman. Part of the problem with this, too, is the, Brigham Young especially is getting sealed to some women just for eternity only. And so. Is that a cover? No. I, a cover for what? I don't know. To plausible deniability that you're. Actually having sex or anything? Oh, I mean, I think it would give him rights to do it by the way that they understood the doctrine at the time. But I think mostly it was a way for people to get it into heaven, you know, with him. He seemed to resent these women the most because sometimes they would write him for money. A lot of his wives had to only communicate with him through his secretary. Hmm. And they would ask for things like, take, you're my husband, treat me as such. You know, I need some money. <laughs> and he would write about how they complained all the time. Sometimes you'd give him money, but most of the time he didn't. Hmm. Brigham's an interesting case study because <laughs> by this point, he's getting older. And all along the way, the sexual dynamic of polygamy doesn't seem to be nearly as big of a deal with him as it has been with Joseph Smith. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. No, I, I think his was motivated mostly by power and status. Um, he did have children with some of his wives, but not very many of them. Um, he ha ended up, I think the official count right now is 56 wives and 57 children or something. Sorry, I've got a lot of numbers. My, someone, if I ever get anything wrong, call it out in the comments section and do your homework. <laughs> I've got a lot of facts floating in here. Um, the one thing I will say about sexual dynamics is I look at like my parents' generation. So my parents were born in the like 1950s and they've been married my whole life, right? Um, that is such a unique thing in history for people to be together and only have like one sexual partner your whole life because our ancestors, these Mormons did not. You need to remember that these early Mormons had multiple sexual partners, whether it was through polygamy or through pre-penicillin times. A lot of people died. A lot of women died in childbirth. Men would go on to remarry several times. Women would go through husbands. Polygamy, especially in the 1850s and 60s, was really messy you could just uh, go to the, your bishop and ask for a divorce, or you could abandon someone and that would be a divorce. And so people would leave all the time and then come back or run away with a soldier and change their mind. And so these people were having multiple sexual partners. So when we look at Mormon morality today, LDS morality specifically, it's um, very different than any other period in history. I think it's very unusual. And we like to say monogamy is like God's standard, one man and one woman like when... Like, that's just not a thing. I'm not arguing for polygamy. Brigham Young would be very proud of me. But I'm just saying, like, it's just a unique time in history, especially for Mormons who don't, like, marry the person that they sleep with. Um, not even your great-great-grandparents were doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, really quickly, did we talk about the hand car companies and the underage marriages? A few thoughts on that one, because there are some, some interesting stories. Yeah. She pointed out Connell's research on that. That's one that the problem with things like this is it, it involves a lot of demographic studies, which take a lot of time and a lot of data that we don't always necessarily have. There's not like you, you can't just go and find the ledger of all the polygamous marriages for a certain time period. So it involves looking through family histories. It involves, uh, you know, records that are not always reliable. But anyways, Connell has probably done more research on this than anyone. And he's noted a much higher rate of plural marriages for these underage girls in the handcart companies. 
But part of that too, and they, these are you know ones that occur within a year, two years, that kind of thing. But then there are other stories that take a longer time to play out. So one that comes out is this woman named Sarah Briggs. And she's a child during the handcart period. Her father dies during the trek. Then her mother comes to Utah, remarries, but then she dies quickly after. So she then goes to her stepsister's household to be raised. And her husband is a man who is being pressured to take a political life, and he doesn't want to do that. And eventually, a few years after that, he's sealed to his first wife, her stepsister, but then also her, and she's only 14. So that's one story. Hmm. Then another one that is becoming increasingly better known involves Levi Savage, who is sort of the hero of the story, because he's the one that tries to push back and says, no, 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 we're leaving way too late. But then eventually says, fine, if you're doing it, I'll go with you. So in the same handcart company as him is a woman named Anne, and he and her two daughters, who Adelaide and Mary, who are five and six during the trek. So they get to Utah after a couple of years, Levi marries the mother. And then in 1868, he marries both his stepdaughters also. Mm. And they're 15 and 16 at that point. So the dynamics of that one are weird. So there's a lot of marriages that happen right around that time, but then also others that happen after a few years play out. And so those, again, are not great stories. I mean, I guess Joseph married mother-daughter pairs, but his own stepdaughters? I don't know. I guess he married foster the, children. The Lawrences are essentially yeah. his wards. So Mother-daughter things happened as well, too. That wasn't completely uncommon. Yeah, yeah. John D. Lee famously did that. Mm. And the, the rationale, which you can argue both ways, is that marrying uh, a woman and then her relatives made it easier for them, which in, in contemporary polygamy, there are women who are like, yes, that did work out. I think you can also see how on the other side of the coin, people are like, no, that would make it a million times worth. I'd much rather have a stranger come into the situation. So that one cuts both ways. Hmm. Well, and maybe this is an inappropriate time to bring this up, but it's it's been used as justification and abuse in modern LDS culture. I've heard too many stories of women who were molested by their stepfathers who used this doctrine to justify it. So, and and the like you said, the rationale, the line, the veil between um, the doctrine and like abuse is very thin. It empowers this kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah. And and you know fundamentalists famously marry some women to their abusers because of this too. So, mm. thanks, Brigham. Yeah, not fun. Okay, well, I think we've covered the Mormon Reformation, period. Does that get us to the Utah War? I think so. Uh, so basically, you know, the government comes in to investigate Brigham. They unseat Brigham Young. Um, the, you mentioned the Steptoe Expedition, right? Steptoe you, Expedition, yeah. yeah. It's a crazy story, trying to kidnap Brigham Young's daughter-in-law. Uh, How was Heber Kimball a creeper? Did we oh, talk about that? Yeah, just, yeah. Do you want to talk about law of purity right now? Sure, that's an interesting one. So our, our friend Christina Rossetti has written an article on this, and it's a concept that becomes better fleshed out later on. But as Mormon theology starts to develop with the growth of polygamy, rhetoric had been mostly about um, ideas of, of sexual purity before marriage. But now that comes within marriage because how does that work with plural wives? And so you get sermons from guys like Orson Pratt who talk about how sex is more or less for procreation, and especially during pregnancy and lactation, definitely not. Hmm. And But then once you start throwing plural relationships into that, that becomes part of a developing theology. And the, the rationale is that men are these much more sexual creatures. And so by having plural wives, then the, the men can be taken care of with their sexual needs. Women don't have sexual needs for the most part, and if they do, no one cares anyways. So that's that's makes that's that easy. often true today. That hasn't changed Thanks, a lot. Thanks, Hubert Kimball. <laughs> and so we have all these, these sermons that are based on the science of the time or the made-up science of the time. And again, the line there is sometimes non-existent. Mm. And so these, these sermons get preached, and... Heber Kimball really, uh, 
it's tough to decide whether Brigham would have been less fun to be married to or Heber. <laughs> And I'm sure their wives would have loved to debate that one because they would have had a lot I'll of stories. I'll tell you who, and I hate saying this, and people are <laughs> quote this on TikTok. Heber would have been worse because at least Brigham Young, you could had good butter from the dairy house. Heber's wives were poor. The, Heber's kids were poor. Heber's boys were known as the Heber Kimb- the Kimball boys gang. They were a gang. They would like get drunk and break the law and steal things and harass women they were bad news they got in trouble all the time heber probably in my opinion the law of purity comes into place because heber didn't spend any time with his wife they were spread out all over the place he was poor he didn't have a a lot of time to be around them and they're running off with soldiers and like i said once he loses one of his wives to a soldier you see his rhetoric become super sexist and it's used as foundational doctrine and text for how we view purity today. And so I have a great resentment towards Heber Kimball because he couldn't please his own women. We all have to pay for it today. And you heard it here first on Mormon Stories. Lindsay Hanson Park expressed a preference for Brigham Young. <laughs> Good catch, John. Ew, 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 uh, uh, And part of that, I kind of have to think, is because Heber was genuinely in love with his first wife, Valate. Mm -hmm. That was a very good, healthy, romantic relationship that seemed to work pretty well. Brigham's relationships were kind of never good to begin with, so adding more to the mix, why not? But yeah, Heber, his wives were... But they had, uh, what, peach sauce and... and that's, bread and butter oh, I and forgot peach about sauce. that with Brigham Young had bread and butter and peach sauce. He were Kimball. You just had disappointment. Lots of sermons about the, the potter. Yeah. A lot of clay metaphors. I bet if you talk to the right person in church headquarters, you could still be sealed to Brigham. I bet there's still a way to make Th- that happen. Thank you for that. I'm so excited. <laughs> that could uh, be a real Mormon stories event. You know what? <laughs> Mormons, if you hate my history, you can do that. You can do that to me. And um, posthumously seal Lindsay to Brigham Young. Oh, he'll love being married to me in the next life. <laughs> and Brigham would do that I with women that I will make it a real him. good time. Talk about wife number 19. Hmm. Try wife number, what, 50, whatever. Trust me, her and I would like each other better than him. So, <laughs> Speaking of posthumous ceilings, Anna Eliza tells a story that there was uh, a woman that came through to the Salt Lake Theater that Brigham was immediately smitten with. And she, of course, wanted nothing to do with him. So after her death, Brigham had her sealed to him because he always won. Oh. And can we just say, I would rather, I'd be sealed to plenty of Brigham's wives. I'd, I'd, I'll be with them for eternity. That would be a good fit. Hannah Tapfield Hannah, King? I was going to say Hannah. Yeah, we'd get along. You know, I'd take good care of her. I'd take better care of her than Brigham would. So. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, you heard it, again, you heard it here first. Uh <laughs> On Mormon stories, <laughs> Brian's smiling. So <laughs> good work, John. <laughs> um, so okay, so the law of purity was what? It was essentially that sex is strictly for okay. procreation. Okay. okay, it won't be as hard and fast during this period. There, there are a lot of hints toward okay. that it's going to where it's later in in fundamentalist parts of fundamentalist culture that that will be more explicitly developed by some other guys who did not have great relationships with their own wives. But some of that stuff extends into the 20th century, right? Yeah, that's why I think it's important mentioning because it's not widespread, but there were men like Heber Kimball who were telling women, you know, sex was only for procreation. And people will ask about that with polygamy. And so, so again, there's this idea of like, is, is polygamy just for sex crazed men? It depends on the man yeah. and what he does with it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the Parish Potter murders and the castrations, is that something yeah, we, we covered? Yeah, we've kind of covered that. And the Pioneer Day, 1857, we covered. Um, Johnston's army approaching and then Mountain Meadows Massacre. Anything else we want to I mean, we say can let Barbara War? tell more about the history of that. The massacre occurs. We can get into that if John you want. John D. Lee was a polygamist. I mean, you know. So uh, all the main he leaders. He was the main, for those who don't know, yeah. his role in the massacre. So the massacre is the murder of 120-something uh, immigrants coming from Arkansas, partially fueled by the Parley Pratt story. Um, you know, some some rumors say that the immigrants coming through Utah 
are bragging about the, the murder of Parley Pratt. Some say they're brandishing the gun that Joseph Smith was murdered with in Carthage. Uh, there's a lot of allegations that they're poisoning their cattle, which we now know is arsenic and the, sorry, not arsenic, anthrax spores in the soil that comes from all the Western migration. But um, there was a lot of uh, justification for that. One of them was that the Fancher Party was, you know, harassing the women and um, molesting the women, which, of course, this, you know, you just didn't do in Mormon territory because of what the soldiers had done. And so this was justified to uh, basically murder these innocent immigrants. And, you know, we're going to cover this in great detail on our podcast, but Barbara might be a good source. Also, I don't want to steal any thunder, but when they were trying to make up justifications for the Mountain Meadows Massacre, one of the allegations was that there were a bunch of prostitutes in there and that it was okay to murder them because they were a bunch of whores. Basically. Oh yeah, there, there were all kinds of allegations that most turn out to be second or third hand. Um, and it's still, there's no justification that would justify this. But, but really... The murder is interesting if you follow what happens after. That's why uh, Rick Turley and Barbara Brown's book is so good now because it talks about the cover-up. So the debate that's always exi- existed is, did Brigham Young order the massacre or not? It doesn't matter if he did. He definitely helped with the cover-up, and we have good evidence of that. And and the men profited. John D. Lee especially, he was one of the main instigators. He was certainly the scapegoat. Uh, I, I talk about him a lot because... I'm writing about Juanita Brooks, and she was his biographer, so I know quite a bit about him. And um, he, he of course, has at least 17 wives, and um, they get a lot of the cattle, and they get a lot of the clothing from the immigrants that they literally strip off the bodies of these these dead immigrants. And, um, of course, this leads to a huge um, backlash with, you know, it's commonly understood amongst Mormons that this wasn't talked about, but it was, you know, you don't hide the the deaths and the murders of 120 people. The tragedy at the time is Brigham Young and other leaders tried to definitely make it seem like it was an Indian massacre, blame it on the Paiutes. Will Bagley and the Paiutes and the Utes both claim that uh, they were not involved in the actual killing, that they were involved in the raid. Uh, I, one of the things that makes me really like kind of fired up is when we showed this on Under the Banner of Heaven, it was important for me to show that like the Paiutes were framed for this because still Mormon scholars, good Mormon scholars, still believe that Paiutes were part of the actual killing. And they were part of the raid, but if we believe Paiute and Ute sources, they were out of there before then they were used. Nephi Johnson even says there were no Provence during the killing. And so it just depends on who you use uh, as your source. Uh, Bagley says maybe, even in the initial raids, there were maybe 50 uh, you know, indigenous folks that were recruited. But Brigham Young had held several meetings in August and September before the massacre to try to unify the tribes, tribal leaders, and to get them to go to war against the federal government. The tribal leaders did not want to do this. They didn't want anything to do with the Mormons' uh, wars. They already had problems on their own. And, of course, the Shoshone, you know, with the with the Gunnison massacre, ends up getting into, gets massacred by federal government that comes in, and that results in the Bear River massacre in a few years after the Mountain Meadows massacre. So they didn't want to do this. They get blamed for it many years later. John D. Lee um, actually has men dress up as, as Indians and murder the women and children. And there are many stories of the survivors of white men washing the paint off their faces. So I just want people to be more responsible in how they talk about that. You know, again, historians, um, modern historians, I think even Rick Turley and Barbara Jones Brown hold that that Paiutes were involved in the killing. And Will Bagley was adamant that they weren't and Paiutes weren't. So I guess it just depends on who you take as a source. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, well, that's a super dark part in our history. And um, thanks for helping us learn a little bit more about it. What's What's important about that is after this, Governor Young is... Uh, is dethroned and there's a new appointee that's brought in from the South, um, Cummings, uh, Alfred, Albert, Alfred Cummings, Alfred, Alfred Cummings. I'm losing my train of thought. So he comes to unseat Brigham Young and this is in 1857. Mormons have too much, uh, power. 
all of a sudden new soldiers arrive. They they set up their fort right above like where the University of Utah is, and they aim their cannon allegedly where they can point at it anywhere in Salt Lake Valley and as a show of force, and they're going to bring power back. Um, there are several other rumors of blood atonement. Uh, the Duke's party is attacked and robbed of a bunch of cattle. There are several murders. And so the government is going to come in and lay the hammer down. But uh, And so in 1858, Brigham Young declares martial, or before that, he declares martial law. In 1858, he leads the great evacuation where they abandon Salt Lake City, go down to Provo. They're going to um, go to war again with the government. Again, this gets called off and talked out. Um, and then you have... I didn't know about the great evacuation. Oh, you, did you never hear those stories mm -mm. in primary about like how they had to bury the temple? Do you, no, do you I, I grew up story? in Texas. We never heard that story. Did you hear those stories? Yeah. And those are interesting because it's that's probably not their original idea. There's The Crimean War had just been happening, and there that was part of the, the way to get public support on your side is you can't win the war, so you essentially retreat and, and portray yourself as this persecuted people. And that seems to be what's driving it is that they will pull out and the army comes through, and then the coverage of it is these poor Mormons were forced out of their homes by this this marauding federal army coming in. And so they direct this most people to go south, leave their homes, bury the temple, bury the records. And so the, the soldiers come through, and it's part of an agreement, too, is that as long as you just march through Salt Lake, you don't stay there, and then you go out to your camp in, in the west— Fine. So there's these protracted negotiations trying to pull it back from the brink of actual armed conflict. How do you bury the temple sticking out of the ground? Apparently they had the foundation that they had dug and they started to build it and then they had to rebury it. And it was I the mean, Salt Lake Temple. I, yeah, I was always taught it as this like faith affirming story, you know, this delightful story. And the same thing, you know, when Johnson's army comes through Echo Canyon or whatever, or Immigration Canyon, uh, there are all these raids. The Nauvoo Legion is mustered, um, and the Mormons do all this guerrilla warfare, uh, to, and they basically co-op take over Fort Bridger. They set a bunch of things on fire, um, and they stop the army from coming in. So that's happening as stuff, you know, the massacre is happening in the south. And so this is kind of known as the Utah War. And it's talked down, 1858, again, the evacuation. 1859, the government sends investigators, Major Carlton, to investigate the massacre. Um, the the governor, Young, is sorry, he's not the governor anymore, but basically Brigham Young negotiates a pardon for Mormons, blames it on the Indians, sends a report, says it's an Indian massacre. They don't have enough resources to, to see if that's true. Um, and then, of course, within just a few years, he's arrested, or there's a warrant out for his arrest again for it. He goes back and forth. For who? Uh, for Brigham Young. Oh. He gets he gets charged for this. But then 1861 happens, and it's the Civil War. And all of a sudden, Abraham Lincoln's in charge now, and he doesn't have resources. And there's this famous quote that he says, Abraham Lincoln talks about, um, well, first, the Republican Party starts to gain power from Mormons. So the, I mentioned this earlier. We don't realize that the modern Republican Party used Mormonism to gain power. They linked slavery and polygamy as the two relics of barbarism. And what they basically built their platform on was eradicating both. And so um, there was a lot of pressure on Abraham Lincoln to put down polygamy. It was just as bad as slavery in the, in the minds of a lot of East Coast newspapers. And... Abraham Lincoln has this famous story where he says, you know, when I was a boy on the farm and we had all this timber that we had to clear, uh, it was too too big to cut down, too wet to, to burn, so we just plowed around it, and that's what we're going to do with the Mormons. And so Abraham Lincoln tells Brigham, I'll let you alone if you let us alone, and that's what they did, and they pull all the troops, most of the troops, out of Utah in 1861, and they are used in the Civil War, and all of a sudden Brigham Young has power again. Uh, Cummings goes back. Uh, he's almost done with his term, but it's understood he's not going to come back. And he he's a Confederate. He joins the South, so he doesn't return. Um, and Brigham Young thinks that the America is going to fall apart. There's this revelation that Joseph Smith supposedly had the Civil War is going to come, and they think that this is going to be the end, and they're going to be 
finally their kingdom on earth. So he has power again. And this is kind of where we have the government. uh, Abraham Lincoln appoints a new governor. Um, The Mormons don't like him. They complain that he's wicked and full of abominations. He handles, there's this uprising called the Morrisite War, where it's like a Mormon fundamentalist breakoff sect that goes rogue. The governor handles it wrong. And so the Mormons complain and Abraham Lincoln says, okay, we'll give you a new governor. He appoints a new governor. That new governor dies mysteriously within like three months. Um, Yeah, their judges are run out of town. But for the most part, ironically, Brigham Young and the Mormons like Abraham Lincoln. And when he is assassinated, they hold this this vigil for him and they they talk very patriotically about him. He he was very strategic and and knew how to sort of manage the Mormons. But after him, then, you know, the govern now it's the 1860s and polygamy and Mormons have all this territorial power again. And so that's, basically the Civil War saved Brigham Young and Mormon polygamy for at least Yeah, and few he, he actually gets, Brigham Young actually gets permission to muster the Nauvoo Legion from Abraham Lincoln. He puts in a request for a bigger uh, army, and I think Lincoln gives him 150-something soldiers, and they're able to do, they're basically asked by Abraham Lincoln to do a patriotic duty, which is protect the telegraph line. So the telegraph arrives, Brigham Young does the first uh, telegraph interchange with Abraham Lincoln, and it shows that, listen, we're loyal to America. Please let us be a state. Abraham's like, no, absolutely not. But we'll let you protect the telegraph lines from indigenous resistance. And so Brigham Young shows a, a show of loyalty, and that's how they Mormons kind of were involved in the Civil War. They uh, protect the telegraph lines for a little while. I, I had no words. idea Brigham Young and Abraham Lincoln had any correspondence or, you know. Well, Mr. Covers. Tim Ballard would like you to believe that's because <laughs> Abraham Lincoln read the Book of Mormon, but <laughs> that's probably not the case. <laughs> Lincoln is a fascinating case because they are, uh, in private, they'll refer to him as Abel Lincoln, and he's just this complete idiot and... But occasionally in public, they will make a semblance of patriotism. The problem is, is the people bashing back in Washington keep hearing about the private speeches. And the patriotism, they know, is just a slight veneer. And so Lincoln is constantly being hounded to do something about this. But this is the plow around it method. He doesn't really want to do anything because he has slightly larger fish to fry. So in 1862, the first piece of federal anti-polygamy legislation is passed, the Morrill Act. But it's very weak. It really does very little beyond defining bigamy and prohibiting it, but that's about it. It also says a a church that believes in polygamy can't hold property more than $50,000. There is zero attempt at enforcement period. But Lincoln can say, hey, look, I passed legislation. I'm doing something about the Mormons. But that's all it is. But what's so wild is then there's this period of detente, really, and nothing happens. Toward the end of the decade, however, the Mormons say, well, hey, you know, there's this law in the books, but you're not really enforcing it. Let's just get rid of it. And Washington is like, oh, yeah, we never did anything about that. Let's think about that. Mormons constantly shoot themselves in the foot in political negotiations. They cannot shut up about things. They bring things up at the wrong time. And they keep making their cause so much harder because they don't know how to do politics right. They have some guys that do. They just don't have the ultimate decision abilities that Brigham Young does. And there's these fascinating accounts of how Brigham Young will give a speech and it has incendiary rhetoric in it. And rather than taking it out of the published version, he says, no, I stand by it and makes life much harder. Hmm. Did we talk about Thomas Coleman and Dr. Robinson? No, I want to talk about that because this has a polygamy story in it, but it also factors into these this polygamy legislation. So this is a story that's not very well known, and I would recommend reading Connell O'Donovan's work on this because it's fantastic. And it was a story that, like, it just sticks out in my mind as a really important story. So, of course, newspapers, as soon as a month later after the massacre in California, I think the first newspaper, or maybe it's 1858, Bar Road, no, starts publishing about the massacre. Mormons, you know, you go through Mormon territory 
and you're in danger, any outsider is in danger. Well, the Mormons don't help themselves in the 1860s. As the government federal troops are moving out, people are still coming west. Uh, They're coming for gold, they're coming for California, they're coming for a variety of reasons. There's the Comstock load, silver is discovered in Nevada. Um, People are coming out for a variety of reasons and have to come to Utah. And this is bringing a lot of miners, this is bringing a lot of Gentiles through Salt Lake. And Brigham Young is finding different ways to uphold power, uphold the whiskey trade, uphold a lot of the the commerce that's going through. And there is this man named Dr. Uh, King Robinson, who is a doctor, a, a Civil War surgeon that comes to Utah and he decides he's going to stay here. And he falls in love with a young woman who's a Mormon. Her mother was in polygamy and disaffected. And so he marries this, this um young girl. I think she's like in, I don't know, her 20s. She's of marriageable age. And it pisses off the Mormons right away that an outsider is marrying a Mormon girl who's disaffected with polygamy. To make matters worse, he has some money and he purchases, there was a warm springs up um, kind of by the University of Utah. And he purchases it and he's going to make it a kind of like a, a modern spa or an old timey spa. He has a bowling alley, I think at the time too. And the Mormons keep burning down his stuff. They burn down his shacks and they, you know, try to stop him from getting all this power. And he, he makes a fuss about it. And so one night he's called out on a, um, doctorly duty and he's murdered right on main street in cold blood nobody at court knows who killed him this story makes national news new york times reports on it you know they're murdering non-mormons and and the story gets out that he's married he's murdered for marrying a mormon girl that's what what the story is and about the same time is a black man named thomas coleman and i just wanted to highlight his story so Basically, uh, where Third West is now, there was a community of black Americans living in Utah. A lot of them had been brought here as slaves by their Mormon masters. And Thomas Coleman was one of these people. But they had a little uh, settlement where, you know, they could engage with each other. Um, and, And this was very common of frontier towns. People would live according to their race in their neighborhoods, right? So there was a Chinese railroad uh, encampment. There was this, uh, I want to think, I can't remember what they called this, the street. But anyway, Thomas Coleman was there and he gets in a, in a gunfight uh, with another black man, allegedly over uh, two beautiful black women. And Thomas Coleman ends up shooting and killing this, this other man. And he goes to prison for it for a short time, and his lawyer is Hosea Stout. Now, Hosea Stout is the murdery, poisony Nauvoo chief of police that we talked about earlier. Now he's a lawyer in Utah and working for the police here. He represents Thomas Coleman. He eventually gets Thomas Coleman out. No one's able to testify. Thomas Coleman's sentence is short. And Thomas Coleman is placed as a servant in Faramore's little uh, his household. He was the mayor at the time. He's, I think, believe the nephew of, of Brigham Young. And that he happens to be a servant during the murder of Dr. Robinson and a few other really important things that are going on. And um, Connell O'Donovan claims that what happens next is the result of Thomas Coleman being a servant and knowing too much. Because what happens next is Thomas Coleman's body is found um, stripped naked uh, on what is called Ammunition Hill, which is now where the DUP is, the Daughters of Utah Pioneer Museum. They used to keep all the ammunition up there until it blew up <laughs> one day. But anyway, Thomas Coleman's body is found naked with garment markings carved into his skin. And there was an allegedly a note pinned to his skin that said uh, a, a word to all N words, stay away from white women. But what's strange is he was blood atoned, his his head was almost decapitated. And uh, so it was published that he was killed for, you know, hitting on white women. But Connell O'Donovan believes that he knew too much about these happenings in Salt Lake City, that he was murdered because a a grave in the Pauper Cemetery was already dug. Um, He believes... Uh, Connell O'Donovan suggests it's Porter Rockwell that killed him. And I just think it's an interesting story of a lynching that shows the lives of and the dangers of not being, you know, on the ends of the Mormon territory. Thomas Coleman, who is a pawn, he's brought here as an enslaved man. And then 
his his death is so tragic and gory and who knows why but i just thought it was an interesting thing that a lot of people don't know about i had no idea people were killed with the garment markings carved into their body there's some crazy stuff what's that what's the grave digger that got busted Jean -Baptiste. oh yeah that guy he was digging up bodies and Stealing, stealing their the temple clothes. clothes, and then they had to set all the temple clothes out for their relatives to. There, this I tell you, this is a crazy time in history. Navu, nothing. Yeah, all right. I'm, I'm a, I'm a believer. <laughs> Good. Um, do you want to talk about Emmeline Wells? Have you already? Emmeline Wells. So we wanted to highlight the lives of a few specific women growing up in polygamy because they're so interesting. So Emmeline comes from Massachusetts, a fairly well-to-do family. As a young girl, she's a writer, she's a poet, she loves nature, but then she encounters Mormonism and she marries this other newly made convert and they're married and they're both 15. Mm. So that's, at least there's no age gap there, but it's still kind of odd. Then they move to Nauvoo. She comes, her family stays there. She comes with her in-laws and they go to Nauvoo and her in-laws become disaffected very quickly. They leave. She's left there with her husband. They're teenagers. She has a baby. The baby dies. And the economy in Nauvoo is so bad that her husband, James, has to go find work. So he goes first down the river to St. Louis, and then he goes to sea where he dies. Hmm. And so she's now a widow at 17. Hmm. And so she marries Newell Whitney first, who is the, the bishop there and fairly well-to-do. and As a polygamous wife. As a polygamous wife. Okay. The relationship seems to be pretty happy. She loves him. They come to Nauvoo. She has another baby. But then a month later, Whitney dies at fairly young age. So she's now a widow Twice. again at 22. Okay. And then two years later, she marries Daniel Wells, who had been the, the non-Mormon man, friendly to Mormons in Nauvoo, that becomes a convert, and then later will be an apostle and eventually in the first presidency. And the relationship isn't great at first, but over time it improves. They grow to love each other. But at the same time, she is becoming one of the most powerful women in Utah. She's a writer. She starts the Woman's Exponent. And she's mm. one of that generation that gets to know national suffrage leaders. So they're on you know, friendly terms with Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Stanton. What? And so they're... <laughs> and the Woman's Exponent was? This, this periodical that was this, this really important voice for women with poetry and fiction and articles about theology and all these things by all these important women who are this, this powerful generation. And pro-suffrage, I'm assuming? Yes. And the national leaders don't quite know what to do with them because on the one hand, they're very useful to the movement, but they, they're also polygamous wives, and that's not great. So they're relationship with the national movement is very complicated. Hmm. And at different points, they uh, are used by the national movement. At other points, they're trying to use the national movement for their own ends. So they're, uh, there's kind of like a chess match that's going on. But Should we talk about suffrage right now? Just like... Might as well. It's a good time for it. Because, uh, yeah, we'll come back to the Robinson thing because that leads to the Poland Act. But basically... Um, at the same time, polygamy is still a source of public scandal nationally, right? It's, a, you know, newspapers will talk about it for a long time. The anti-Mormon cartoons are really, really interesting. Was it Chris Blythe that put a book together? Who, who did the book of all the anti-Mormon cartoons? There's someone that... Uh, I know Mike Paulus has done some of it. Um, they're wild. It's the Brigham Young and his harem and these just wild illustrations. They're very entertaining. So this gets used um, in suffrage because at the same time you have women um, on the East Coast who, you know, the Seneca Convention and all these things, they, they, Seneca Falls, they want to get the vote for white women. We're talking about white women. And um, they decide a strategy, an activist strategy would be to test the vote in territories and see how it goes. It seems like a safe sale to the white men that are in power if they can test the vote. So women technically get the vote in Wyoming first, but only in local elections. It's women in Utah that actually cast the first ballot. It's um, uh, Brigham Young's, is it niece? Daughter, I believe. Is it his daughter? I think so. S a woman related to Brigham Young. <laughs> and we'll her see. name is? Her name is Seraph. 
Yeah. Seraph Young. Gosh, we should know that. I, I promise I know it. It's just, it's getting late and there's a lot of names. Seraph Young casts the first ballot. So what happens is the suffragists, the suffragists in the East say, okay, let's give it to, to those poor oppressed women in Utah. They are going to surely vote polygamy down. So if we give it to them, they'll vote polygamy down, and then we'll have solved the Republican Party's promise. We will say women have voted their way out of polygamy. So they meet with, you know, uh, Emmeline Wells and Eliza R. Snow and all of these leaders. And they, you know, we have a lot of feminist writings about how women should have their own voice. And it's really powerful stuff that myself as a Mormon feminist really found a lot of strength in. You can't say that these women didn't have autonomy. Look, look at Emmeline Wells's great reading. She loves polygamy, by the way. Like, what? Like, how does this happen? Uh, turns out Emmeline Wells hated it privately, but publicly she was a big defender of it. Her, My heart broke when I read her journals, um, hers and Martha Hughes Cannon and all these other women. But anyway, so they give the vote to women in Utah. Women don't vote the way they want, so they end up taking it away with uh, one of the acts to, to get rid of polygamy. But polygamy was one of the reasons white women got the, the right to vote. Whoa, before it was taken away. Before it was taken away, yeah. <laughs> and, the, and the year window of that was around? So, well, we're going to talk about it with the Edmunds Tucker Act, okay. which disenfranchised all women in their vote. But um, oh, Okay. Oh, I should know this. 1870, 1870, I think, is when the votes are actually cast. It's It seems like Wyoming gets it in 69. Yeah, 1870. But it's 70 okay. in Utah where the women vote. I was going to say 71. Okay. I think you're right, 1870. Okay. Lindsay doesn't know the suffragist history. Uh, it's late. Not it's tonight, like a, folks. For those who don't know, it's like 11, 11 o'clock at night. So, and we're two and a half hours in. <laughs> so, we're cutting Lindsay some slack. Um, so, we talked about Martha Hughes Cannon in the North and we have Martha. Not. Let's talk about her okay, real quickly because okay. she is such a fascinating story. Let's do it. So, she's born in 1857, right in the middle of the Mormon Reformation, except she's born in Wales. Wales. So she comes across at the age of three with her family and settles in Salt Lake. And she's one of the few women that actually benefits from Brigham Young. Because what Brigham would do is he would see these, these younger girls or young women who had talents and would often assign them things for the, the building up of the kingdom. So her, he encourages her to learn typesetting. So her first job is a typesetter for the Deseret News. And, but her, her secret desire has always been to be a doctor. And so this is that generation of, of Ellis Reynolds' ship and this first generation that gets sent back east for this great education in, in medicine at the time. And then they come back and will teach classes in midwifery and these kinds of things. So she goes back to, after graduating from the University of Deseret with a degree in chemistry and goes to Michigan. Whoa. And she gets her MD there. She stays in the area. She eventually will earn four separate degrees. She was really smart. What? So she comes back to Utah and then becomes the resident physician at the newly created Deseret Hospital. And as part of her work there, she gets to know Angus Cannon, who Which, is... Which, really quick, women crowdfunded and got this hospital set up. It was Mormon women that did this. There's not a lot of good... Well, there's not a lot of good medical care on earth, but... At the time, they don't have a lot of organized care. So they set up this hospital, which will be v extremely useful. Um, and so she meets Angus Cannon, who is the administrator of the hospital. He's the president of the original huge Salt Lake Stake, and he's also madly in love with her. So they, she, he marries her as a plural wife in 1884. And it would be really hard to pick a worse year to get married as a plural wife. This is when the legislation is really ramping up, and so their life is not fun. They try to keep it quiet. doesn't work. Angus goes to prison. Um, she goes to Europe for a time with her baby, and then after things more or less calm down, then she can come back. And then, of course, she's so famous in later life because she is the first woman elected to a state legislature in the U.S., and Angus is in the same election for the same office. He doesn't win. Mm. So she's, she's a very famous, fascinating woman. There's a, a, our friend John Silito and, and Constance Lieber published their correspondence while Angus is in prison. And it's fascinating because like Emmeline, she's a public defender of polygamy. Privately, she just wants her husband, who she does love, to pay attention to her. 
and her heart is broken over and over and over. That's the one, like, I, I, as a Mormon feminist, I was like, hey, we have to respect polygamy, like women's choice if they were choosing it. But then, you know, reading Martha accused Cannon's defenses of polygamy, you're like, how can you say this woman is an idiot? Like, how can you say she's being coerced in anything? But then you read her diaries and her letter to Angus. He's taking a plural wife that he's courting on a on a carriage and she has to see it. And she writes, how do you think I feel when I see you with her? Like, and you can just hear the pain in the correspondence. And I was just like, oh, this was a lot more complicated than their public defenses. So, theoretical yeah. polygamy and lived polygamy are extremely. And that's difficult. the same thing with Brigham Young's feminism. I mean. I'll point this out. People will be like, Brigham Young cared about women and women's education. He sent these women to become doctors. Yeah, he saw the utility in and the efficiency in having women do good work because the women were doing awesome work. And he was no dummy. It was like with anything else. If he saw something that worked, he was gonna take advantage of it. And so I don't think he should get any credit for like not oppressing women more, but, um, yeah, she's Mark, a rare story. She's, she's fantastic though. Mm. And, and also it, it, sadly in her case, at the end of her life, she burns a lot of her papers, mm. which is such a shame because those would have been fascinating, mm. but we know, we know enough about her to, to know, um, signature just published a, a brief biography of her. That's very interesting. So, She's she's a fascinating woman, and she's up in the north of Utah at that time. Which leads us to Martha Cox. Yeah, I'll just um, hurry with her. So she was a midwife down in the south, um, and we have a lot of her journals and incredible stuff, too. So it, it was interesting. I bring her up because the women in the north and the saints in the north versus the women's the south, and I'm talking about southern Utah, it was a stark, stark difference. And so to see what they did with resources is interesting. But what I really like about a lot of the women in the South is they were mystics. Um, you know, I was, I hope she doesn't mind me saying this, but I was doing Elna Baker's genealogy for her and found out that her grandmother was a tea leaf reader at this time. They, they would go to her and she would read your tea leaves. Um, there are, Martha Cox was an herbalist um, and a fantastic diarist. And because of her, we know about several plural wives, I would definitely recommend the Plugmas Wife's Writing Club by Paula Kelly Harleen. She talks about a woman in there, um, Martha included, uh, who they enjoyed the company of their sister wives more than their um, husbands and were more excited about being sealed to their their sister wives and their husbands and saw themselves as natural fits as plural wives because they liked women more than men. And so um, I think Polygamy worked on the few rare occasions if girls liked girls, <laughs> I think. So read about that in a Polygamous Wives Writing Club. Um, I think that that doctrine made sense to some of those girls and uh, women. And Martha Cox is just fantastic because she shows up in a lot of Juanita Brooks's research. So I wanted to highlight her name. And the, the end of kind of the early Utah section you've got here, a discussion of the wives of John D. Lee, and then a discussion about Dixie and Dixie Wine. And, well, yeah, I just wanted to talk about that because I Southern Utah history is a, is a great love of mine, thanks to Juanita Brooks and a, a lot of her work and reading a bunch of the journals she transcribes. And thanks to Warren Jeffs and his good work. I'm, I'm sorry, that's dark. No, no, no. But I mean, show. actually... Juanita Brooks did work with Shore Creek. It's interesting that comes into play, and we'll certainly talk about that. Um, no, Dixie Dixie was the area that the Mormons called Southern Utah because they grew cotton, and so they likened it to Dixie of the South. Um, it's now being there's a debate on you know appropriating that term and how dangerous that is, especially as you know there's a lot of uh, different people and cultures now that live in Southern Utah. It's not just white Mormons. But uh, it was called Dixie for a long time, and what a lot of people don't know is that early on in the 1850s, Brigham Young sends, you know, hundreds of people to the southern Utah to try to have their own self-sustaining economy. They tried uh, the iron mission. They thought there might be iron with all the red rock down there. That didn't work out very well. Hmm. Then they tried cotton. Um because the soil was, it was warmer there and they had very moderate success with cotton. So then they tried silkworms and, but the, the economy that really worked is the wine economy. Uh, grapes grew really well there. So the wine what? economy, yeah, grew 
fantastically. Um, Tokerville Wine, the Nagel family was called and set apart to run a winery. What? And yeah, and in the St. George Temple cornerstone is a bottle of Dixie wine. What? Dixie wine was quite popular. Mormon leaders loved it and Brigham Young took advantage of it. Um, do you get different, you get different, um, takes on how good the wine was they often sold to the gentile town of silver reef and gentiles said you take one swig of dixie wine and you're out you're done and so they punished us for that later on (laughs) yeah we got we got stuck in silver reef it was a whole thing and when we did all the locals said it's because the curse of brigham young he cursed it because it was a gentile town and they still believe it today uh, and we know because we got a flat tire there. The curse is real, folks. Um, but yeah, Dixie wine. Wine was a huge part of the culture. Uh, John D. Lee would have it at his wedding parties. Um, his wife's are really important to me because I've been working on uh, with my writing partner, Mandy Olson, on several projects involving them. And so um, I just I know his wife's very well. One of his favorite one of my favorite women in Mormon history of all time is Anne Gorge Lee who was one of the child brides of John D. Lee, one of his last wife, his last wife. Uh, she ends up becoming kind of her own Calamity Jane. She leaves him and starts dressing like a man. And she writes this crazy autobiography, which a lot of scholars have said is, you know, full of inaccuracies. And it is a wild story, but um, I've been chasing it line for line for line to see what's accurate. And way more of it is accurate than the not, but she does have stories like Porter Rockwell and Heber Kimball throwing, you know, bodies of virgins in the endowment house basement, you know, stuff that that is probably absolutely not true. Um, but she has a lot of stories that are true, and it just sounds crazy. Uh, she claims that she rode with, um, oh, what's Geronimo and Billy the Kid and all these kind of crazy stuff. But really, her, her narrative is a trauma narrative. You know, she went through a lot. Um, her parents are said to have traded her for some calves or ewes, depending on whose story you believe for John D. Lee. And um, there's another story that says that her parents were trying to get out during the 1850s and 60s. They knew that it was dangerous and they knew about the castration of a local boy and to save their lives and got traded for John D. Lee. So who knows uh, whose story to believe. But I think his wife's, again, John D. Lee shows up a lot in my talk because of Juanita Brooks and then I'm writing her biography. Going back to the vineyard really quick. Um, first of all, why isn't why isn't there vineyards in? Well, let me just a tiny bit of history. Like those who have never been Mormon or Orthodox, believe you Mormons that don't know their history are going to say, "What Brigham Young wine?" Everyone should know that that um, while the word of wisdom, uh, you know, sort of like said, avoid strong drink, which I think was meant to be kind of hard liquor. seems like beer and wine were allowed, even by the, you know, DNC 89. Wine of your own make is is more or less acceptable. Yeah. So Mormons drink alcohol all the way through the early, you know, like with approval, all the way through the early 1900s, correct? Heber J. Grant was an alcoholic. Right. And he was prophet in the 50s? Yeah. Born in the 50s, yeah, 1856. No, when was he prophet? 1940s? Oh, uh, he's uh, 1918 to 45. 45, yeah. So so uh, this this whole thing about Mormons don't drink alcohol and it's like completely forbidden, that's a 20th century, early to mid 20th mid, century yeah. development. So, um, so people shouldn't be surprised that there were high level Mormon leaders in the 1800s, not only drinking alcohol, but like having distilleries or... Or vineyards. Joseph Having, F. Smith would get drunk and beat his wives. Right. Wife. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But then why didn't those vineyards persist? Because there's no Sonoma sort of equivalent here in southern Utah. Tell that there to is. Shark Creek. Or yeah, there is. there is. There's actually a wine <laughs> tour and um, there are vineyards. But is that a that new vineyard? Or? Most of them are, but like in Short Creek when we went, so there are, I, I'm sorry that I don't remember your names, but I toured their vineyard. So there's some ex Mormons that went and bought Rulin Jeff's vineyard in Short Creek and uh, have started their own vineyard. So you can go buy Short Creek wine. Uh, I've had it. It's, I I'm, I'm grew up Mormon. I don't know wine, so I have no idea if it's good, but it tasted great to me. Uh, 
there's a whole wine industry that's that's um, growing now, and I just helped the Salt Lake Tribune do a profile on Dixie wine, so hopefully that'll be coming out soon. Because the history is kind of crazy. It, was, it became a really robust economy, and for a while it was the only economy that really sustained all of Mormonism. They were shipping it up um, in huge batches, and there are funny stories about, you know, peddlers would— the, you were supposed to get a permit through the territory, so through your bishop, basically. So the bishop's storehouse was actually making their own wine and, and selling it. You could pay tithing in grapes, and the bishops there's, are lecturing their congregants on not giving their best grapes for tithing. So they're making bad wine, but the stories are funny of these peddlers coming with gallons of wine up to Salt Lake City, and they don't even make it through Parowan <laughs> before they've sold all their wine or drunk it themselves. So yeah, it became a problem. The Kimball boys, like I said, were known for getting into trouble and causing damage. Um, Brigham Young was getting really irritated. And, and one of the stories that we talk about in this article I'm talking about is that you used to have sacramental wine in a goblet that you would pass around and people became drunks and, uh, you know, they would take the whole swig of the wine. And so Brigham Young instituted the little sacrament cups and that's where we get those from. So you couldn't chug the whole thing. And then you have stories of boys in town that would show up only for communion, you know, just to get a little <laughs> free wine. So it definitely was a huge part of the culture. Juanita Brooks has this great story that when she was a little kid, she was at her grandma's house and she hurt herself. She like burned her finger or something. And her grandma gives her, oh, she had a stomach ache and her grandma gives her some cherry cordial wine. And pretty soon Juanita Brooks becomes drunk mm. and um, her dad comes in and and the grandma's crying, I got your daughter drunk. And he sits Juanita down and he says, listen, Juanita, there's some who can take it and some who can't, and you're one who can't. <laughs> so stop. So yeah, it, it was a cultural thing for a long, long time and hard for a lot of people to break, including Mormon prophets. So do we know what got rid of the, the vineyard? Yeah, so the economy shifted, and part of it part of it was as Brigham Young was losing territorial power, he wasn't able to regulate it as much and, and regulate the permits. And so there's this influx in the silver mining towns where they're starting to make their own town their own wine, and it sort of waters down the industry. And so then they can't control the 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 um quality of it as much. And so eventually they shut it down. The Tokerville winery is still there. You can see the Tokerville big house where they had a big, huge gallon. They were instituted by the church. I think I want to say, gosh, it's been a while, like 1880s that the Bishop's storehouse shuts it down because there were just other economies that made more sense. So it really became an economic thing. It wasn't like a spiritual thing, but Brigham Young was irritated. He thought, you know, people that, that got drunk were weak so he didn't like weakness of any sort. Mm, okay. Well, um, what I think we'll probably do since we're coming up on three hours is have this part two be kind of polygamy under Brigham Young. And then we'll talk in later and figure out how to, how to partition the next part. Um, so some of the things we have left, we've talked about the Moral Anti-Bigamy Act of 1862. Were you going to introduce the Poland Act of 1874 and, and yeah, a couple of things? Yeah, we could do the Acts things. Up to the Manifesto and then call that an episode. Yeah, yeah, or we can just end at Brigham Young's death, whatever you want. We're, okay. We're, yeah, let's get into polygamy legislation really quick. Yeah. So the Poland Act is important. So like I talked about Robison's death, Mountain Meadows Massacre. Even though the country is dealing with the Civil War, they're like, oh, shoot, we let the Mormons get away from us. So they send, even, they send a regiment in the Civil War to try to get power back. And it takes a while. And this is where you have these, these judges, these runaway judges. Mormons try all kinds of things. In fact, there's this... I, I'm forgetting the details, but uh, at one point, Mormons carve a bunch of fake wooden guns and threaten one of the, the judges with these fake guns and that they don't know are fake and they think that they're going to go to war. Mormons were driving out judges. They had a, a good time doing this. Um, and so the government comes up with the Poland Act, which basically says um, it, it basically takes over the probate courts. From territories. It's targeted at the Mormons. And like I said, the bishops are running the probate courts at this time. The high councils are running the probate courts. And so this allows federal mar marshals to come west 
and take control. And so this happens in all the territories. And this actually gives some teeth to the Bigamy Act, which has no teeth at all. But it basically says federal marshals can come into the town. And once that starts happening, we see the succession of several acts, the Edmonds Act and then the Edmonds-Tucker Act, which really has teeth. But the Poland Act is important because what it does is it allows the feds to come in and start arresting people. And that's why Brigham Young is allegedly, uh, it opens up uh, accountability for Mountain Meadows Massacre, which he again skirts out of. It, um, you know, they investigate Robinson's death. But of course, Mormons are really good and wise to this. And they don't, you know, whenever they need a witness, all of a sudden no witnesses are to be found. You know, nobody knows anything about anything. Yeah. Do you want to talk about the Edmonds Act and Edmonds Tucker? So Poland starts it. And then in the intervening years, it's still not really being enforced because part of it is Mormons are arguing it's not constitutional and they want that tested. So that's where we get the Reynolds case in the middle, an absolutely landmark exercise of religion case. And so finally in 1879, the Supreme Court upholds it and says, yes, all of this legislation is constitutional. So let's get moving. So in 1882, the Edmonds Act is passed, which allows them to really start arresting people. And it's at that point that we start seeing actual arrests and imprisonments happen. And part of that is because they they create a new offense called unlawful cohabitation, because proving a polygamous marriage is really difficult. You have to know a date, you have to know an efficient, all these kinds of things. And those records are either not being kept or they're not available. But unlawful cohabitation is a lot easier. That's a pregnancy. I saw them go in, he saw him go into her house. Testimony alone can do that. And so that's when we start seeing arrests happen, but not enough. And so then in 1887, they get really tough. And they, uh, this one more or less disenfranchises all practicing polygamous Mormons, but it starts to hint at even just belief in polygamy is enough. And that's really scary. That's when the walls really start coming in. And part of that, I think we'll talk about next time, is what's not what's happening in Utah. It's what's happening in Idaho that's driving this. And that's part of the broadening of Mormon studies is looking at other Mormon settlements in the West. And at points, what's happening in Idaho is more important because it's driving Utah. Mm. So we'll, we'll get to that next time. That's a fascinating story. So, What is the Brigham Young, Hampton, and Sting? That's such a fascinating story. So it's the prostitutes uh, we promised earlier. Oh, okay. She mentioned Anne Gorge's autobiography. It's published in a book called Playing with Shadows that also includes the Brigham Young Hampton story. So this is another Brigham getting spurned story because uh, B.Y. Hampton's mother is being courted by Brigham Young, who loses. And so his bronze medalist, he gets to name the kid and he says, name him Brigham Young Hampton. <laughs> so in Utah, he's a policeman, and he is actually indicted for the King Robinson murder. And really quick, he's he's not Brigham Young's biological son, but he's sort of an adopted son. So we're going to call him B.Y. Hampton because Brigham Young Hampton is confusing. But he's still, even though he's not biological, Brigham Young really takes him in and gives him power and treats him as such. His mother is sealed to Brigham Young for time after his father dies. So Brigham will take him under his wing. So he's involved in several cases as a policeman that are rough. There's one, they're constantly breaking up saloons and brothels. But in one case, the madams of the brothel sue the city and they win a judgment, a big one. And so the police are constantly doing all these things that get them in trouble. And then in the 1870s, they go in and break up a saloon and the man's name is Engelbrecht. And he, this court, this case gets kicked up, kicked up until they... In 1872, rule that, this is back to Judge James McKean, that's buttonheads with Brigham Young, and all the way that the juries had been formed before that are now illegitimate. And so hundreds of cases are thrown out, including B.Y. Hampton's case. So he wins this one. Mormons love this. But then the big one comes in the 1880s, and there's a shift in the, the power because Brigham Young, his protector, namesake, is dead. And Mormon leaders are now no longer going to protect him. So what Brigham Young Hampton's idea is, is let's get back at some of these hated federal officials by doing a a brothel sting. 
So he hires two sex workers <laughs> to do some detective work for him. <laughs> and they try to nail some of these guys that are visiting the brothels. And they get a marshal up in Ogden. But the problem is, is the DA doesn't want to prosecute any of them. And in fact, they turn it around and they accuse Brigham Young, Hampton, of running his own brothel. Oh. <laughs> and so there's this great account that he's held not in jail, but at the courthouse by his friend in the police. And hundreds of visitors come in. They bring him all sorts of alcohol, back to our alcohol discussion. And he finally gets released on this, but now he has a bunch of debt because he's got to pay these detectives, the sex workers they had working for him, and church leaders throw him under the bus. Hmm. And then in the 1890s, there's another case where he leases a building from the Brigham Young Trust Company that holds all these buildings from Brigham Young's estate. But there's a lot of shadiness. The red light district in Salt Lake is running largely on lands from the Brigham Young Trust Company. And Brigham Young Jr. is furious about this. So what happens? Brigham Young leases this building. Brigham Young Hampton leases this building. And then a part of it is sublet to another woman who then sets up this really elaborate brothel in the building owned by the Brigham Young Trust Company. So many Utah brothels. And Plum he, Street, old Plum Street. Yes, down, yeah, down in the, the red light district there. And Hampton Wait, argues... Is that in Salt Lake? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, downtown, yeah. It's by the Carl's Jr. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. There's a, there's a chicken place that's now not a brothel, <laughs> but it used to be. If you know the right person, maybe in the back. You well, and they, they had the whole stockade, which Brigham Young, actually, the, the, the government puts uh, sort of west of Salt Lake City. They try, like, okay, we can't control this. Why don't we? <laughs> Let's have an organized Let's red Let's have light an district. organized red. Yeah, that was a good time. Hmm. Until it wasn't. And, and then he argues to the judge, well, I didn't know that this woman was subletting this part of the building. And the judge agrees with him and, and releases him. So he continually petitions for help for his debts. And finally, toward the end of his life, the church gives him $3,600, more or less, to shut him up and get rid of him. And isn't one of his plural wives uh, Hannah Tapfield King's daughter? His, his plural mm-hmm. wives, B.Y. Hampton's plural wives, are a mess. This is People are like, think of their polygamous ancestors just getting along. Brigham Young Hampton gets attacked by one of his wives in the street in Salt Lake City. She tries to claw his eyes out. Whoa. So, uh, his and this first happened wife is her daughter. Is, to him. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it was a messy time. I have in my ancestry um, a plural wife that tried to break the arm of another plural wife over water rights. So it was a, it's not an easy thing. Hmm. It oh, was the ugly. holy principle of God. Scratching and clawing at his clothes in broad daylight. On the streets of Salt Lake City. Ugh. Yeah, it was messy. Yeah. Yeah, we talked about this a little bit last time, but when I read about my grandmother and great grandmother, grandfather and great grandmothers, and how messy their polygamy was, that's just a few generations removed from me in Franklin and, you know, in, you know, Napoleon Dynamite territory over in Franklin and Preston, Idaho. And Logan is super sad, super dark. We think that they all, you know, the the husband lived with the four or five wives all in a... No, it's like they moved on. Sometimes they abandoned previous wives, like we mentioned. Sometimes the wives would get addicted to something because their lives are so hard. In my great-grandfather's case, he had two wives. He was sent on a mission with two wives, and then kids died while he was on his mission because the women were super poor and, like, didn't have food or medical care and he was a doctor like it's crazy how awful these stories are that's why todd compton i can't believe we haven't said his book yet todd compton's book in sacred loneliness the title is so perfect in sacred loneliness it was mostly lonely and miserable especially if you were married to a leader because it meant more women less time yeah Yeah, it was it's it's not i mean it's not a pretty thing it's not it's messy like you said very, very messy. And that's how your polygamy started. You went and just an episode per wife of Joseph Smith, right? Yeah, I have Todd Compton to thank for that. I highlighted the wife's using his work, and he's become such a dear friend and mentor. And I, I'm just going to plug his book, In Sacred Loneliness, about the wives of Joseph Smith. And In Sacred Loneliness, the documents, his new book, he adds even more texture to their stories. So definitely support his stuff. It's great. So as we kind of close out this part two about kind of polygamy under Brigham Young, 
Number real quick, how wealthy was Brigham Young, and where did he get all his money? This is a really super short, rapid fire question. Anyone know? So he w- he was wealthy, but his estate was really complicated. I I can't give a short answer to this. I'll basically oh. say after his death, it was heavily contested, and it the money ends up going to the church, not to his wife's, which you know. John Taylor, the Gardo Gardo house, all of that stuff. It it, it was a really sore spot for people, but it was something that even Joseph Smith hadn't figured out. Uh, Brigham Young becomes a trustee in trust. He learns a little bit from Joseph Smith stuff. So he basically has all the property, but the federal legislation will mess with that. And so that's part of, it's not an easy answer because he's transferring property back and forth. And at one point they're actually renting church property from the government because the government can seize their assets under the new law. So um, in theory, he wasn't, the money didn't belong to him. It it belonged to the church, but it also belonged to him. But I, I will say he lived better than most people around him. So okay. he was doing okay. That was one of the many legacies of Joseph Smith is where is the line between personal property and trustee and trust property? And that's something that Emma had to deal with. Uh, the big mess that happens after Brigham Young's death is you have a couple family members who take it to civil court to try to deal with it. And there had been a committee appointed of church leaders to try to handle it. But then these guys go an end run to the court system, the real court system. And that both pisses off the church and the committee, but also drags it out for years and years and years. And it's it's not resolved to anyone's liking. The Gardo House was one of the most expensive buildings in Salt Lake City at the time. Brigham Young was building it to be a house to entertain, you know, dignitaries and everything. And he had his favorite wife, Amelia Folsom, who never had children. She was very dignified and beautiful and wore fancy dresses. She was going to be the hostess. So she lived in the Gardo House. I mean, it was opulent. And after he dies... Uh, Amelia is basically kicked out by John Taylor. He was like, no, 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 this is my house now. It belongs to the church. And that was an example of what Brian was just talking about. She kind of gets kicked out and um, too bad. You're out of luck. Your husband's dead. New guys in town. Is this Gardo house still around? No, it burned down, unfortunately. Oh. It's, Where was it? Um, um, it? It's downtown. It was kind of by where City Creek is now. You can go down to the DUP and they have a they have a model of it. Uh, which is worth looking at. And there there are some surviving photos. It, it's spectacular. And John Taylor uses it in the underground to hide out. But it, uh, like it's glorious. It's such a tragedy that we've lost it because the architecture was really interesting. So did Brigham Young's wives get the short end of the stick after oh, yeah. he died? Oh, women always did. Oh, women always did. It, it, this is a problem with polygamy now. Like, And this is why people, you know, I fought to help. I I spoke out to decriminalize polygamy and people are like, you want to legalize polygamy. Polygamy will never be legalized. It's a nightmare to do it because if you do that, if you legalize it, what does it mean for property? What does it mean for inheritance? These women, at the end of the day, you saw the brethren do this all the time. It was convenient to have these wives as their wives when it was. And when it wasn't, they'd be like, it's not a legal marriage. Oops, sorry, it doesn't belong to you. Hmm. And this happens to a lot of women. Hmm. So that's sad. So did other subsequent prophets take on Brigham Young's wives as plural wives and that tradition continued? Brian, you're shaking your head no. Not really. They more or less just kind of live their own lives. Part of that is Brigham Young is 76 when he dies, whereas Joseph Smith is 38. So, so the wives were older. And all these guys desirable. had tons of wives at this point. Like they're, yeah. And at, yeah, the, the doctrine and the theology had changed quite a bit at this point. Brigham Young had developed the Adam-God theory. Um, we didn't even talk about that. But um, basically, that people didn't need to do that anymore. Um, Amelia Folsom, it's, there's this weird thing. If anyone out there can solve this problem for me. So I'm a Levitt, like Juanita Brooks would come from the Levitt line. There's this interesting ceiling that Levitt family claimed that Amelia Folsom was um, sealed to a Levitt later on in life. I can't find any records, so I'd be curious to that. So some of them did get resealed or married, you know, married again, because some of them were younger. But um, yeah, no, Brigham Young kept his wives. He even got posthumously sealed to Martha Brotherton and Anna Eliza Young and the women that spurned him. He He showed them in the end. That's gross. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's gross. Okay, so speaking of Brigham Young's grossness, uh, yeah, I think from social media you get the sense that Lindsay, you don't, he, Brigham Young's not your favorite dude. That's why I made that joke before. Um, if you if you had to summarize 
like your main, if you had to summarize your main beefs with Brigham Young, and you could also talk about his virtues, I'd love to hear that just a way to end this episode. And Brian, I'll invite you to add in whatever you want to add. Do you, cause I mean, you don't, you don't love the guy, right? No. And, and part of it, I will acknowledge this is where my bias is. Uh, it's part of it is he's a scapegoat for a lot of my anger. It's, it's easy for me to blame him a lot. I, I have seen and witnessed in my position at Sunstone and in year Phlegmy and doing this work with you as you have too. so much pain, um, stared into the abyss so long that it stares back, you know, and, and sometimes I have to take breaks because it's the pain and the, and the, the legacy of this can be so awful. Um, and so when I hear people talk about, he was a great colonizer, I'm like, are we bragging about that now? Like, yeah, he was really good at dominating people. Good for him. You know, he was a mob boss. He ran things like a mob boss. So good job for being a mob boss. And when, when Mormons extol his virtues too often, they're ex extolling his crimes. They're like, he was really good at defrauding the government. He was really good at getting out of this scrape. He was really good at, you know, this thing. And I'm just like, you guys, come on. He was a good organizer. He was a good colonizer. I mean, to, to pull off what he did with all the things against him, I guess that's a weird hero's journey in a way but my gosh is that what we're going to hold up and we do and that's why mormonism still hurts people that's why the doctrine is still so painful it's a violent frontier religion and i i'm sorry it doesn't have to be everyone i know and love is mormon and is affected by by stuff that brigham young has done and so yeah i'm mad at the guy probably unfairly so because a lot of the good things that i know and love about my community comes from some of his decisions too and i have to begrudgingly acknowledge that but that guy uh knew how to wield power uh, as a weapon and um gosh he brought so much pain and harshness into to our theology and called it love and I don't think I'll ever forgive him for that. And I don't think I have to. And if that colors my work, so be it. But uh, I have sat through hundreds and hundreds of hours of, of people trying to put a pretty face on his terrible ideas and his pain and his misuse of power. And I'm going to claim this as, as my position. Like, I, I can acknowledge that he formed and made me and I can resent that as well. You know, I I think his harshness called love is is dangerous and I and I still see the impacts today. And every time we make excuses for him and try to hold him up as some champion of good, um I can show you a hundred uh, you know, buckets of tears that he's caused and created. So that's where I stand on him. He's kind of notorious for his statements about black people that are horrendous. I mean, some of the most horrendous statements about black people come from Brigham Young. He also said really horrible things about women and their appearance and, you know, th them as property, right? And here's the thing. We, we talk about this all the time. The, the thing that was so interesting about him is he was funny. He would say the most horrible things, but he would say it in a funny way. And when you do that, I mean, it's the Oscar Wilde quote that I think about all the time, like, tell them the truth, but make them laugh or they'll kill you. Brigham Young did that, but inverted it for evil, right? Like he would say the most horrible things, but you'd have to laugh. It was clever. Brigham Young was a clever dude in all the ways. And so he did all of these horrible things and we laughed and we started to laugh so much that we stopped noticing how terrible it was. And the, the, the problem with modern Mormonism is that we never, because we never completely repudiate any of this stuff, it still lingers. And so you have folks like me who deal with LDS people, these are LDS people who live in fundamentalist uh, viewpoints and, and lifestyles. And I have family members who are like this, where they will still use Brigham Young's ideas and there's nothing to stop them because there's nothing to counteract it. And if you have Brigham Young, who was a prophet that says something and there's no prophet that's coming out and saying he was wrong, which very few people are, uh, then the danger of the frontier still remains. And even though we hide it and we try to say, oh, we don't teach that anymore, the journal discourses we don't know, until there's a firm denunciation of these doctrines, they're going to still linger. And they still linger. And we see them in fundamentalist communities, and I see them in my own life. And 
again, I talk about Brigham Young and people would be like, you, you're biased because he was a really, he was a badass. He came, he came across so much, um, you know, resistance and look at how he did that. And I'm like, okay, dude, if that's what you want to hold up as success, good. But to me, power is not, um, is not violence. It's not domination. Power is abundance and sharing and kindness and vulnerability in spite of everything. And Brigham Young was the opposite of that almost every time. So to me, he's a, a roar shock for how we value uh, values. Mm-hmm. And um, too many Mormons still think he's great. And he was really good at colonizing. I'll give you that. But I'm sorry. I don't think that that's a good thing. Mm. So as we see like Confederate statues go down, I'm sure you have an opinion on if, if Russell and Nelson came to you, a Mormon prophet, Russell and Nelson came to you and said, should we rename BYU, you know, Provo, BYU, Idaho, BYU, Hawaii? Should we come up with a new name and not have it be named after the man, Brigham Young? I'm sure you have uh, thoughts about that. I have a hard time because I'm a white lady, right? So like I'm not hurt in the same way by like the racism of Abraham Smoot or Brigham Young. So so I don't know that I get to have an opinion on that. I will say for the things that he has said about women or polygamy or the stuff in the ways that he has hurt me directly. Just the mob boss stuff too. (laughs) Or as an ally, you know, in the ways that he's hurt the women in my life. I think about my mothers, my grandmothers, the pain in our family because of doctrines like his. Um, I'm not one, and I'm I'm not saying this is right, but this is where I'm at. I'm not one for erasing history, so I'd rather instead of trying to erase that they happened, we acknowledge that they happened and we deal with it. Like, how much more powerful would the church be? Rather, I don't need them to rename anything. I need them to start acknowledging. And I need them to start acknowledging what happens today and like how it impacts us today and how we're still complicit and how we still extol it as a virtue. That's the problem. It's not that the man existed or he did bad things. Lots of people have done bad things. It's how we contextualize it, how we erase it, how people are sitting out there listening and criticizing how we're talking about this because I'm saying my real opinions and saying, oh, we can't listen because that's bias. Everybody is biased. This history is high stakes and it matters. And it hurts people. And every time that we make excuses for these men um, hurts. And so, no, I don't want them erased. I want them held up for what they were. I want a more holistic history. To me, that's the answer. Maybe erasing them is the answer. Uh, That erasing that hasn't helped me. Um, You know, I was doing a a documentary on uh, Mormon fundamentalists uh, that I, you'll see in a coming out in a, in a little while and I was trying to look up their history and they were erased from the family search and I it was so frustrating because I couldn't find anything on them I don't want to erase the bad stuff I want us to talk about the bad stuff still Emmeline Wells University I like the sound of that and I like the sound of Martha Hughes Cannon University what okay do you think? yeah see I mean so there's one in Provo there's one in Rexburg and there's one in Hawaii you got three women's names maybe Juanita Brooks University could that can be can they third? wear overalls though <laughs> like what would Emmeline what about, Wells what say? about purses shoulder strap with the purse I mean it's just like it's so sad to me it uh, my heart breaks like people will say that I'm disloyal to our people but I'm loyal to Mormonism this is why I still care about it. I'm the most loyal. I want us to be good. And I'm not saying I'm perfect. Like I've had a very messy life myself, thanks to the bad values I was brought up on that we called good and, you know, honest. And as we unpack all of this, like it's hard, but I don't need these guys to be perfect. I don't need Mormonism to be perfect. I just need us to have better conversations about it. And I think we struggle with that so, so much. And that's what we're trying to do. I think um, anyone that's trying to do better history is is a good thing um, because it, it has real impacts today. And I think it's impacted everyone that, that I know and probably that you know, too. Mic drop. All right, Brian, I'd love to hear your uh, summative <laughs> thoughts for this episode. This is not my wheelhouse, but I'll throw in a couple you things You mean sharing here. thoughts and feelings? Well, just the, the application of it is, is Lindsay's the, her head, yeah. less where I'm... But, Brian had a great Mormon experience, so he's just like... I'm, I'm, I'm approach it, um, and, and that's part of it, too. But he I, tolerates me, so he loves you all. I, I <laughs> am, at this point, I'm less... I'm, I'm, I'm very history-focused, but 
it's about bringing. But you've got to have. Certainly, you have feelings as you're. You're a feeling guy. Sure. But you're um, just saying it doesn't belong. Well, you're like just, Dan McLeod. Like that's not my strength. Yeah, definitely not. Okay. Um, but uh, Brigham Young's great success, if you would call it that, is holding a Mormonism together. He does hold Joseph Smith's legacy together. The problem is, is that necessarily a good thing? And the means by which that happens frequently are not good. And and uh, I would be fascinating to see if they did rename BYU, who would you choose as the name? That would be a fascinating discussion. I'd love to see that play out. But, <laughs> um, yeah, that's... Um, I say, how about Beatrice Roberts? No, it needs to be a woman. It needs to be a woman. <sighs> see, that's the thing is you're going to have an <laughs> endless stream of problematic figures. The question is, are they <laughs> less problematic enough? But um, And his his talents are are much better suited to that, that Mormonism of hands and feet of moving people from one place to the next. When he becomes Brigham Young, the theologian, Brigham Young, the policymaker, his talents are not there. And he would admit that, right? So says he, you. He he did, <laughs> and so. But the yeah. problem is, is is the fruits of Brigham Young, the theologian, and Brigham Young, the policymaker, last to uh, a, a length of time, a duration, and a degree far beyond where they should have. And so that's where he really becomes problematic, is as as theologian, as policymaker. And I think that's uh, that's pretty. Undeniable. As Christina Rossetti says, make Adam God again. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> we'll talk about that, which we skipped over when we talk about fundamentalist history, because that's where it really comes back to life. Okay. And I'm confused because I, I remember reading in David O. McKay and the Rise of Modern Mormonism that between Joseph Smith and David O. McKay, none of the presidents of the church, I, I guess, took on the title as prophet. Is that wrong? Because then you got Brigham Young saying, I was speaking as a pro man, now I'm speaking as a prophet. I so. actually have a date where he was ordained as one, so I can tell you. Okay. Tracking the evolution of terminology and ideas is is very difficult. Hmm. And it, that's the kind of, those, those sort of like the, the marriage rates during the Reformation is the kind of thing that very well could be. It's just that to say something like that requires... A lot. And I, I'm definitely mm. not going to accuse Greg of not doing his homework. <laughs> but And do I want to break our promise and use my notes? Oh, yeah, it's of cheating. course you do. Absolute cheating. And I, I, may, I could be misquoting Greg. No, Brooks. no, no. That's def And that's that's become a, a very common thing people bring up from okay. that book. Okay, okay. It's probably, I, I'm, it's certainly more complicated than that. Yeah. Yeah, because I know he was... Um, Ordained as prophet Sarah and Revelator in one of the meetings Brigham Young was. Okay, yeah. I well, say that, in the 1850s. Well, that's an, a, a conference sustaining. That's the terminology they used. I think yeah. his gets to more like in in public settings, newspaper coverage, church coverage, that kind of thing, using that specific term. Yeah, okay. Is what Greg Interesting. was getting I didn't at. know that. I've read the book and I did that, that didn't stick out to me. Well, um... I want to end this episode like we ended the last one. I want to give you both a chance to kind of plug all the things that you guys uh, that work on and that mean a lot to you. Brian, I'll let you go first this time. So let's talk about some books that were useful today. Um, for the territorial period, David Bigler's Forgotten Kingdom is a very useful book. For the role that, that women played in that part of history, again, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich's House Full of Females, excellent book. Um, for Brigham Young, John Turner's biography of him is excellent. I really, really liked that one. Um, and is Arrington's kind of out of yeah, Leonard's out of was good. It 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 was a much better biography of Brigham Young by far than anything that ever been out there. Right. Um, but the, Turner's is, is the, the one problem now. with Arrington's book. I think is it shaved off too many of the rough edges of Brigham okay. Young. Okay. Um, and uh, I think that's on brand for Arrington. Yeah. John's was better. I think at giving a little more accurate picture of all of Brigham Young. Okay. I really, really like his book. Any that you come to mind for you? Books. Yeah. I mean, the best book in Mormonism for me will always be Mormon Enigma, the biography of Emma Smith. 
I really like uh, Kingdom of Nauvoo, Ben Park's book. I'm biased because Ben's a good friend of mine, and his book, American Zion, is going to be the new history of Mormonism concise. So any, you know, non-Mormons, like Ben Park stuff is is the great, like, entrance because it just covers all the things. And Todd Compton stuff, um, of course, is great. When it comes to this period of history, any of Will Bagley's Kingdom of the West series, they're very expensive. But man, those books are fun. They they have so many good things in there. Um, he just they're playing with shadows is one of them. It's it's if you want to buy one, buy that one because it talks about all the apostasy happening in this time period and all the violence, and it's a really good one. Um, gosh, this is like making me pick a favorite child. I'd rather pick a favorite child than a p- favorite book at this time. <laughs> There's so many good ones. Polygamy and prostitution. Um, yeah, I don't know. And if you're going to buy a Mormon book, buy it from? Come to Benchmark. Yeah. we uh, The Kingdom in the West volumes, we frequently have those used. So that's... So good. Uh, it's, it's one of our favorite things is to find people kind of at the beginning of building their library and going down these rabbit holes <laughs> because... Uh, then we get to suggest all this fun stuff that they'd never heard of. So. And definitely listen to our podcast, Sunstone Mormon History okay, Podcast. Wait. And you can you can also buy books online. You yep. don't have to visit Benchmark Books. You do not. Right? Benchmarkbooks.com. Okay. You can Give us a call. call. Yep. Yeah, buy your freaking Mormon books from Benchmark Books before Support you buy them your on Amazon. and us. Yeah, because they're doing yep. great work. We'll get you signed copies of lots of things. Yeah. Signed by Will. And and when you come to Salt Lake, go visit Chris and Brian and all the folks, right? It really feels like the old Mormonism, like the old ZCMI, like tithing script, like we support our own. We go to benchmark books, but it really <laughs> is like it's an institution. They, It's a crazy, crazy place for tons of books. And you can talk to Brian or Chris who know everything about everything. Yep. All right. Okay, you were saying you're polygamy. Sorry, um, yeah, you're polygamy. Yes, and uh, Mormon history. Um, Sun Sun Mormon Sun. history podcast. Yeah. Uh, donate, subscribe. Leave How us, do they donate right? to that? Go to sunstone.org. Leave us a donation. Sun Sun's just become this little, a monthly donor. Become a monthly right? donor. Yes. How often thank you put you. out episodes? I've never been good at uh, self promoting this way. It's a Mormon woman thing in me, and you've tried to help me over the years, and I just suck at it. I just do. I'm not good at. Any of this. So, we all like, are putting out regular episodes. We are. Bi-weekly episode, bi-monthly. Bi-monthly, yeah. Um, bi-weekly, every other week. Oh, gosh. Words are hard. Uh, <laughs> support uh, support Sunstone. Come to our symposium at the end of July. It's always the last weekend of July. Don't plan your events around it. That's what I would say. Support us. But coming to that, um, that really helps. You can support Year of Polygamy. That supports me directly. And... Um, yeah, support Mormon scholars doing really good work, I think, a- across the spectrum. Don't just buy books from people you agree with, you know, buy it from historians you disagree with, too. So become a monthly donor to Sunstone History Podcast. Sign up for monthly donations to support their monthly content. And uh, just as a as an earlier call, and this goes to myself, too, you know, let's, let's do our own work. You know, it's easy to sit and point fingers at Brigham Young, but we're left and inherited the impact. So like get into therapy, like do your own work. Don't let your trauma spill out onto others. And it's very hard to do in life, but uh, it's our responsibility. So let's, uh, you know, change the legacy of our people to something better. Beautiful. Well, I know my viewers and listeners are going to love these two parts. And if I can prevail, uh, I would love to have you guys back to talk about post Brigham Young. There's so much more. There's John Taylor. There's Wilford Woodruff. There's the three manifestos. Now, I know about two manifestos. Didn't know there were three. Uh, The smooth hearings we're going to talk about. Holy moly, that sounds fantastic. And then we're going to get to all the... All the freaking fundamentalist stuff, right? And other 20th century things. It's going to be a year of polygamy. <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Lindsay Hanson Park, for uh, joining us again on Mormon Stories. And thanks, Brian Buchanan. Thank thanks, you so John. much. And it's, fr- it's almost midnight. So we. Pre- <laughs> Holy Ghost done? goes to Are bed soon. <laughs> we'll see. We'll talk. Anyway. Thanks to you both. Thanks, everyone, for viewing and listening. Thanks to Julia and Maven and Gerardo and uh, Brooklyn and everyone who makes our job at the Open Stories Foundation possible, including our board, Clint and Carrie. 
and everyone who donates to make uh, Mormon Stories possible. We appreciate it. For today, support these guys. We'll talk about how you can support us another time. Be good to each other. Be kind to each other. Uh, and uh, we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care.